what the Church of Scientology is so afraid of. This, this is SPTV. Hello, welcome back to my channel. Today I have a very special guest, Catherine Olson, who she and I worked on the same team in a manner of speaking for many years, but of course never knew each other because there is very much a, uh, a, a sort of iron curtain that exists between Scientology organizations and it's something we were briefly speaking about the other day and I wanted to bring her on to have a more comprehensive talk about this. So here's Catherine. Hello. Hi. <laughs> hey, great to see you. You too. Um, nice to meet I, you. Yeah, nice to, yeah, I feel like we're old friends. You know, you're, I first became aware of you, you're, uh, the talk, the, the interview you did with Chris Shelton, which I think I was still, uh, in, I was not getting out of bed yet. <laughs> I was hiding in a dark corner of the world, oh, trying wow. to figure my shit out. <clears throat> and I tell you, it was, I'm sort of, I'm exaggerating, but it was a, a really a great interview. And I was just riveted listening to your story. And I, I so related to it. Like I understood every nuance, nuanced little atom of your story was something that I could, it, it, I wasn't in the sea work. I didn't have to escape. My, uh, the bonds that trapped me were far different. So thanks for just stepping out. Cause I think it's really, really important. Well, thank you. So, um, yeah, you're very welcome. So I mentioned in your intro that you expressed to me that you had uh, an interest because y you were so isolated. I mean, you're most of the time you spent before you went to Ohio, you were working at the the Hubbard Garrett, I mean, the Hubbard, the Hollywood Guarantee Building yeah. on Hollywood Boulevard. And you're right in the middle of one of the most, you know, major metropolitan cities in the world. And, but you're completely isolated. Tell us about that. Uh, I spent 25 years in the same about three square miles of LA. So that was my, that was my whole world. That was my whole universe in between the, the birthing and the Hollywood guarantee building. And I was, uh, I was on the pack base a little bit, not very much. I was on project there. I did various things there sometimes, but I wasn't really there very often. Right. I was at CC a few times for various reasons, but I was never posted there. I was in the management building, the Hollywood Guarantee Building, which is um, upper middle management. So it's it's right. It's a lot closer to in management in a lot of ways, but uh, you still don't you don't know what's happening at the end base. I didn't know what was going on at the end base until I left. Seinfeld. Well, <laughs> a lot of the people at the end base don't know what's going on at the yeah, end base. Yeah. I mean, there, there are so many uh, walled gardens. I hate to say gardens, say gardens, because that sounds like a kind of uh, inviting, but sort of, there's so many little walled off cells. Uh, like, you know, when you talk about uh, that a kind of an organ uh, authoritarian organization practicing information control, yeah. it, it's intense. It's so intense that I'm sure that at where you work, people didn't know what they were doing. Um, they're very yeah, from, good about well, information control inside. Yeah, this. it's it's amazing. You know, I actually meant yeah. to grab uh, a, a graphic of the uh, the the organizing board because if you look at it the way it's laid out, it's sort of a design. When it's designed sort of in in two dimensions, uh, you know that that it, it it defines every activity and mm -hmm. every job in the entire Scientology universe and every organization and many individuals are governed by the principles in it. And what it basically is, is compliance flows up the board and pressure flows down. Yeah. And it's a way of defining information lines of information of communication so that they can be really kept uh, locked down. It's, uh, it's amazing. Anybody who's interested, just Google Scientology organizing board and take a look at it. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. And I tell you, ever since I was in the Sea Org from, from 1994 to, to 2021. Um, oh, thanks Goldie. <laughs> anyway, ever since I was in the Sea Org, they were trying to figure out. I'm boards. sorry. I'm going to keep embarrassing you for a moment. So. <laughs> I just want you to know. I mean, this is such Alex a Alex is a really good friend of mine. He's yeah, he's, I, he yeah, he's I, really good stuff too. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I'm so sorry, Catherine. It's okay. <laughs> we're, we're also here to have a little bit of fun. So. Yeah, totally. I love doing these interviews. Yeah, I love. I've met. I've made so many friends through doing these interviews. 
it's it's really cool. I, yeah, I, I can. I no uh, idea I was going to make so many friends when I left Scientology. Yeah, because <laughs> for all those years, for all those years, Catherine, that we were in Scientology, especially those of us who worked for the church. I wasn't in the Sea Org, but I certainly worked for the church. Uh, and this goes for all Scientologists. You don't have friends because you can't confide in people. That's right. You could be very friendly. So I kind of, I, I think of the people, I call them friendly. You see, I was friendly with so-and-so, but they're not friends. But now you meet these people in this community. And I know that I could call you up and tell you, and I've never met you in person, but I could tell you I've had some problem and I could discuss it. Yeah. I, would, I could feel 100% um, secure in, in knowing that it would just be between you and I. Yeah, no, you can't please. do that as a Sea Org member or staff no. or, or even public. Like, you can't do that. No, you might as well just write the knowledge report and turn it into ethics right. rather than even on talk yourself, to yourself. Right? Yeah, on yourself, because that's, <laughs> that's, all, that's what's going to happen. But see, please go on, continue. Uh, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, uh, well, you were talking about being isolated at the, oh, home, yeah. At the issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So I was there. Um, I was, I was in that building from 1994 to 2019. And like I said, I didn't have like all of our orders and directions and, and programs and projects and this and that and inspections and all this stuff came from the in base and later on more from RTC because the in management right. disappeared, which we were aware of, but nobody <laughs> understood what happened. Yeah. Literally, I was, I was, okay, so I was in, let me see if I can describe this. You know, there's a lot of people who've never been in who don't follow all the nomenclature in our, yeah. our right. whole language very well. So I try to, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get more into describing things a little bit better. I know. They're, they're a pretty savvy bunch. I yeah. wouldn't be overly concerned, but we'll, we'll explain as needed. Yeah. So I was in what was called, at, at one point, I was in uh, what was called the Data Bureau, which um, I was there for seven years. And we used to do this whole thing every week of getting all the reports and statistics and from the orgs. And we used to have these um, um, real time chat computers set up with people from the int base who were asking us, you know, where's this, where's that, what's, where's all this stuff, right? Because you'd have like the data bureau at the int base that was right. doing what we were doing, except they were doing right. it for everybody really and doing it for Miscavige. And one day we just didn't hear from anybody. Literally, it was it was that fast. It was like, it was like you heard you got all these this communication, and the next day, nothing. Wow, nothing, and you didn't hear from anybody, anybody in it management for months. Wow. Like all these missions that have gone up, all these different things, and everybody just disappeared. And right, we, and it was a big mystery. It was like, where did they go? What happened? Uh, okay, maybe they're all doing something really important. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, I'm just curious about the infrastructure. It was, these were like private, it was like a intranet. It must have been, it couldn't have been. Um, the, uh, it was, it I must have been, they must have had, I didn't know about this. I, I, I mean, I knew, I knew about the Merck system. I, I thought. Yeah, I it was, it was the Mercury system. Oh, okay. I got it. System. Yeah, that's. But that's it was even more than that. It was a direct, it was a, it was a, a chat line. Yeah, like a dedicated what yeah. they call a tie line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I know what it is. Yeah, I and we had like four of those set up every week, and we used to talk to people from from International Data Bureau and from RTC every week, and and they would just be like, you know, yelling at you over these chats, essentially. And, <laughs> and then, then they were sudden, gone. <laughs> wow. so everybody was gone. It was the weirdest thing, and we're all like, okay, and you never heard what exactly happened you just got like bits and pieces and you know miscavige talking about you know people people uh talking in events about people um paddling behind the ship if they didn't get certain projects done and whatever so right. can, you kind of put things together okay i guess i guess everyone's in trouble or everyone's on special projects or something and we we had like a bunch of our, our execs right. disappear up to go up to up to Ant, and they just they just never came back. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I was seeing all of this. Some of them. I'm sure I know all of them. Yeah. Uh, if you throw any names out, I'll let you know. First, you will hear. Yeah. Raz Kember. Uh huh. Uh, Don Cunningham. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, 
Claire Edwards. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I yeah, very well. I, I knew Claire Weinberg. really well. Yeah, Rena. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know all these yeah. people. They, they all ended up in the hole. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you know, if you want to know, I mean, I did that reaction video to Golden I, I, for, to the gold video that I was featured in that I yeah, produced. I saw that. Yeah. So, and you saw all the names. So, you yeah. know, the names are published. Anybody can find them. But I put them on a video, and all of the names you mentioned are, they're all on that list. Uh, they all ended up in the hall. But then just, after I, they, but then where are they now? They well, the last I was there, which was only a few years ago, they uh, when they obviously they had to be let out. I think. I think they got rid of the whole, I know when we did that video in 2014, it was still going on. Miscavige had blown the base, literally left. It told me personally, he was never coming back because too many people there effed him over. Uh, and, you know, then he set up shop at ASI in LA. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they, then they took them all out of there. They were worried about an FBI raid. Uh, so they took them all out of there. And then they bulldozed it down, and you know it's it's a nice piece of landscape, you know, it's uh, property today. It's just flower beds and grass, where it used to be. There's not even a plaque saying, you know, dedicated to the former Sea Org <laughs> members. Former SP. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there should be like a nice wow. little plaque there. Maybe maybe we'll sneak up there and put one on. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, there's a the last that I saw there was a project called the Analog Project which was essentially, uh, you can imagine the mountains of analog material that the Church of Scientology had accumulated since its inception. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about analog videotapes, uh, uh, printed documents, audio tapes, all these things are analog and they wanted to get them into the digital domain so they could all be searchable and, and preservable because they're big on that. So they put all, all of those people they put them all on. Um, they put them all on that project of just this mind-numbing work of just yeah. scanning and and digitizing and that kind. Of, that's what they were all doing. I mean, as some of them, like the former CEO, my former assistant Lisa Schroer, uh, the, AKA the Dragon Lady, AKA the Pit Viper, um, she ended up in the laundry as a seamstress. So, wow. and they, they seemed all happy to be doing it, like. They were just glad to be off of, you know, leftover food and, and you know, having to be to work all day. And, uh, you know, once the news about the whole hit, they, they were all sort of let out. They could go back to their apartments and so forth and eat wow. in the dining room. That's when I first became aware of it, when they got marched into the dining room every day as we were leaving. You know, there was me and a handful of professionals working up there and, and we would get longer meals. So we would be leaving the dining room as they were being marched in. And so I was like, wow, all these people. And I knew they were in trouble. I didn't know the full extent of it until after I left. It's but such it was... a waste of people too, because so many of those people are like, like very dynamic, like very uh, like driven people. Like they're not, it's not like a bunch of idiots or a bunch of people. No, that... no, no, no. And they were committed. You Don't know that. They were... or anything. Yeah, like you mentioned, like Rena Weinberg was an amazingly bright, committed yeah. person. You mentioned Claire Edwards, who was just like, you know, she was uh, speaking at events for a while. I don't yeah. know if you remember. Yeah, I remember that. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, so, uh, and I personally witnessed her being brutalized physically and, and verbally by Miscavige. So yeah. she was one of the people that, anyway, that was one of the things that started to really dislodge me from Scientology. Because it's just yeah. like. You know, you can only compartmentalize for so long. But yeah, so then there's the there's that firewall, that sort of iron curtain between where you is. But, you know, at goal, like none of the staff up there could reach out to any other org except like if you grew up with your best friend and you joined this here together and they were in an org in L.A. and you were in an org, you would never communicate with them. You would never see them. That friendship would essentially be severed. Maybe yeah. you, by some miracle you'd get a day off. Uh, and maybe you could meet with them, but that, that would be it. I mean, I know this first, you know, one of the, uh, I was kind of, I wasn't subject to that because I was in the Sea Org. So they used to use me, believe it or not, like as a, as a, as a, like a, like a tool to. <laughs> Find out how their friends were? No, 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 unofficial business. Uh, yeah. 
no, now that I'm out, I have a lot of people reaching out to me, asking me about people at the base. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Like, what kind of an organization do you leave? And then people want to know, I haven't seen my brother in 50 years. Is he okay? You know, it's just like, if that doesn't say it all. But no, we had business, like the, the record, uh, Gold owns a recording studio that used to be owned by Chick Corea called Mad Hatter Studios, a very noted studio that Paul McCartney, a lot of people cut albums there. And that, uh, Chick sold it to the church, and now it's part of Scientology Media Productions. But we used to use it as a kind of extension studio when we needed voiceovers and we didn't have time to have talent from LA drive up. And so normally there'd be, you know, we take like, you know, a day or two to set up the line that people from gold were going to come down and use the facility. But I could just call on my cell phone and say, hey, I need to come down there and record something. So they were constantly having me do that. Yeah. It, yeah. It was, they just have the most arbitrary, they're, they're the most arbitrary yeah. line of communication. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, especially uh, for some reason, especially gold, they feel very privileged up there. It's very, very narcissistic environment, uh, even though, you know, it's, it's stratified to the point where gold is looked down on by the int people across the street. Not everybody, but for the most part as an org. But there were certain people in Cine in my area that were not looked down to at all because they were the high producers. Like yeah. I was one of those people. So uh, Yeah, you heard about I heard about that from 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 Mark Headley when he was like at first it was like, you know, the int the the people from the int uh not in base, but like in management were the ones yeah. that like all high and mighty. And then they all got in trouble. And then yeah. some cabbage was like, gold is the only uh, gold are the only people working around here. So then gold were the cool ones. And it was, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I, yeah. I mean, when I got in trouble and I was helping, I had helped open Scientology media productions. And then I, I went back up. The only work I had, I could leave to just quit or I go back to gold. So I went back to gold. And uh, one of the things they were developing was this, documentary series because Miscavige thought it would be cool to let you, you may know about you've seen the documentaries on Scientology media production yeah. they're just different you know they were supposed to sort of align with you know like be like-minded like about human rights or whatever and so they were trying to come and I was set up there and accused of being you know you know a degraded being and all the great you know at did they not want you at SMP well like uh after right part. before it opened, I got thrown out of there. Wow. So, well, I didn't really get thrown out. I was told to go back to gold and do a program, an ethics program, and then come back. Wow. But then the politics at gold was such that they were never going to let me go again because I had really helped to bring that place into the modern age. So they really needed me up there. So what did uh, you I, I hope you don't mind me asking, but what did you do that made them not want you at SMP? Was it something specific? Well, a number of things. Some of it was just like behavior that was unbecoming to a Scientologist, <laughs> you know, mostly, like, you know, stuff in my private life, yeah. which, uh, you know, everybody's allowed to have a private life. And uh, so, the, and then some of it was just ideological because I felt that the studio should go in a certain direction, that it shouldn't just be dedicated to, um, like inward facing, like like infomercials and saying how great Scientology is, I thought because the studio had previously been, uh, when it was a public television station, it had been very engaged with the city of Los Angeles, that I thought the studio should do that. They should find like uh, you know like like um, you know human rights uh, champions in L.A. and musicians and artists that were trying to create less harm in the world and they should really focus like put a spotlight on those people and show what the the supposed inner heart of Scientology is that they that they say they have but they don't have it because even when they had an opportunity to express it and they had the tools to do it they still could only talk about themselves and how great they are that's right so I had a big problem with that and I started and then there was you know to be really honest um, the the late L. Rich, L. Ron Hubbard biographer, Danny, Danny, Dan uh, sorry. No, Dan no, no. Sherman. Yeah, Dan Sherman, my dear friend. He, we were good friends. He was, uh, he had some physical problems and he became uh, severely addicted to opioids. 
like when he was talking at those events, he was pumped up on opioids and steroids. He was like just fucking so high out of his mind. Uh, and eventually they put their foot down and they, they had to get him through a program and a Purif. And he said he would only do it if I was his like twin. So then I had to commit to that and handle my work. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you know how that is. Cause nobody's yeah. like, well, that doesn't mean you don't have to do all these other things that we need you to do. So then, and then when that happens, then anything in your personal life becomes magnified and then they just make it about that. Yeah. Uh, so and yeah. They, and they, they take they, any little thing they can possibly take against you at any, any time in your past. And yeah. Like, yeah, you're, you're bad because of this. You're out of ethics. Yeah, this thing yeah. Ten yeah. years ago, and I'm sure there's many people watching this. Well, there's yeah that uh, can relate to that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there there is that. So that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, life at the imp base. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably just as fun as life at the at the HGB. Well, I think yeah, except because I guess but you really could because you're right like, next to the cabbage. Yeah, because you couldn't. Well, it it actually got a lot better after Miscavige left, uh, because there wasn't that continuous pressure from this one individual who was, you know, had people locked up. And yeah. I mean, everybody at Gold, like people don't think about it. Everybody at Gold knew about that. Uh, I'm not going to claim some kind of innocence by saying I didn't know about it, because I certainly could have known about it. I was just kind of. Uh, I prefer to just focus on what I would needed to do in yeah. terms of films and so forth. Uh, but everybody knew about it. I mean, it, it, it was run by gold, the whole, it wasn't yeah. like an it program. It was yeah, or, HCO was right. Yeah. All of the security guards yeah. were gold security guards, you know, I mean, John Brousseau wasn't gold, but he put the bars on the windows. Uh, he's told that story. But yeah. yeah, it was a gold project. I mean, locking those guys up, it was like, it's amazing. And, and you know, and some of them, I mean, I know a girl in, uh, born in the Sea Org who works in HCO, both her and her sister. And her sister was in there. And like, she was like, okay with it. Like, I never understood that. Yeah, I don't uh, know. If you're, if you're a hardcore, dedicated Scientologist, and especially if you're a hardcore, dedicated Sea Org member, it's like, you have this this idea that anything that 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 comes from your senior executives and especially from Miscavige, it must be okay, and it must. Yeah, be it's it yeah. Okay. He he is yeah. You're right. No, he's just uh, he's protecting the the mission when he does that. Yeah, and and I think the 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 greater the severity with which he exercises his his you know his dictatorial nature. The greater the severity, the more he gets admired because it's like, wow, man, that guy's, you know, he's a great guy. You know, he he took all those people and locked them up, and they were all just trying to mess with the, you know, with the program. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't take any crap. Yeah, exactly. Hey, here's a question for you. Uh, uh, this is from yeah, Alex, your friend Alex Catherine. What did you know about the int base while you were at the HGB? Did you know where it was? What went on there, et cetera. I, I knew that it was some of that, but I ahead. knew that it was someplace in in California within about an hour to two hours drive because you'd have these you'd have a van with a draw with a driver that would go up there that would come to the HGB and go back to the int base twice a day. Right. So you knew that okay, there's somewhere close by. Um, I didn't know the exact address for quite a while. I think I may have heard something a few years before I left, but, but you weren't supposed to know cause it was supposed to be confidential. I mean, I worked for, I worked for about four years getting people cleared to go to the int base and be posted there. Um, and I was over that whole unit for a little while. So right. Right. I, I knew that that's where in management was, that's where gold was, that's where RTC was. And it was like, it was like the, the, the heaven of the Sea Org, like everything's perfect there and everyone, everything's standard. And that's where you want to go. I mean, I wanted to go at one point, I wanted to go to gold and be in Cine. I was like, I want to go. I, I mean, I, know. I, I never made I know. it because, because my, 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 my mom created a little, <laughs> a little bit of a stink. Right. right. Yeah. You were connected to somebody. Yeah. I, yeah, I know. I mean, I had uh, another, there was another professional working for, with me. He still works up there. And he uh, he had a family issue like you had. And just one day we were sitting at lunch and one day 
somebody came and whispered in his ear and he ran out of the room and he drove to LA and then we talked later and, and he got it cleaned up and he could come back. But they're like that ferocious about it. And the place is horrible. Yeah. They, they, the, at least especially when Miss Gabbard is around, they, they yell at each other. They scream at each other. They, they, they miss meals. They miss sleep. The place is so far from the Eden that everybody thought it was. It was yeah, just and, like, and, and they used to, they used to take people that were, that had family members who were, you know, making a stink or making, you know, did some sort of media thing or whatever. They used to just right. kick them out immediately. But then I think right. when, when Miscavige's own niece did it, like, then right. you're going to like, okay, double standard here. Okay. You get to stay and I have to leave. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, he, he, he was, yeah. This, his entire family is out. So yeah. yeah. Well, not his whole family. He's, but, I guess he's but, but then I, I think it became a little bit, um, a little bit, more accepted and more like okay well if you know if you're not being weird and and you're going to disconnect from your family then you can stay type thing i mean there's there's certain things they yeah. wouldn't do like you couldn't go to the int base you couldn't go to smp or anything like that like i couldn't i yeah. basically couldn't do anything that i had the purpose in doing because i'm an artistic yeah. person so i'm like i can't do any of that because yeah because my no, i understand uh, yeah it's amazing it's uh i don't know how i got away with it for so long um, yeah, my former wife had had uh, responded to the to the uh, Debbie Cook email and blah blah blah. Uh, She's no longer in Scientology, but yeah. that was isn't that was never you know she never spoke out, but that wasn't a problem for me or my being a golden pump for her. Whatever she has other Scientology family members, and uh, we're on good terms. But uh, it's very inconsistent. A lot of these families is especially if people don't speak out, there's a sort of a detente that exists within the family. And then some of them go like Aaron Smith Levin's story. Some yeah. of them go really out of control and nuclear, uh, but it's not all consistent. It's very inconsistent. I mean, it's, it's consistent in the sense that if somebody really speaks out and attacks the church, they're going to create that kind of problem. But there's yeah. a lot of people that fall under the the definition of what they would consider a suppressive that they don't even bother with. And now with SP Nation having like become a full fledged first world country. <laughs> I know it's such a thing. It's great. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I love it. I mean it's, I it's love it. Like bigger... I said, I so many friends through these interviews. Yeah, and uh, people. It's yeah, really cool. And, and it's it's bigger than Scientology. So yeah. Yeah, you know, has, I mean the 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 channels, the the affiliated channels on YouTube are the the viewership that we capture is far greater than uh, yeah. the Scientology TV network, and I know that because I helped put that whole thing together. So anyway, wow. there you go. Uh, so that was that question. We'll see if we have any more. Left that up through a while. I think he asked something about Claire. Yeah, Alex Claire is the 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 brother of what is his name? Neil Neil. Gaiman. Yeah, Neil Gaiman. Yeah, Neil Gaiman. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I I was trying to stay away from the name dropping, but oh. yeah, Neil Gaiman yeah. is one of those people. When we're talking about the detente within families, yeah, uh, that would be one of those things. You know, it's like it's like don't ask, don't tell. Except it's not about you know. Uh, sexual preference it's about religious orientation not sexual orientation yeah. and, you know one could assume neil gaiman is oriented away from scientology here's a question for me when you produced the apostate alex he's my go-to question guy when you produced that tour of gold video did you have to give consideration to the confidentiality like show only gold buildings and not bonnie view etc well no not really i mean the bonnie view wasn't part of the whole thing i mean nobody Nobody said don't point a camera towards Bonnie View because, uh, you know, we don't want it shown because where we shot, I, that thing was very specifically about and shot at gold. So you could, you know, gold's on the south side of the street. So you can't really see anything across the street. Yeah. But Bonnie View's way up the hill. But there was no, I mean, can, remember when we did that thing, I didn't even know about the hole. It was like 200 yards away. I knew all these guys were in trouble. I didn't know that they were locked up for what, 14 hours I, a day or something. I have, I have a question. What did you think um, was going to, what, what did you think L. Ron Hubbard was doing? Did you think that he was going to come back or that he had gone off to Target too? 
Well, I never drank that much Kool Aid, Catherine. Really? I gotta tell you, no, I never did. But you, what? What? what I case mean, I was. Level I, were you? I was saying again. I missed what, the last. What, one. what case level did you get to? Oh, I got up to OT five. Wow. So you know, I I had a pretty thorough indoctrination. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I could give you an hour speech on how the the very specific steps that you take uh, in terms of orientation to you get to the point where you open that pack and you read about BTs and you you have been so much of your core identity has been reoriented in a very strange way that it's actually you accept it it's it's a different context you know when you see it on south park it, you're seeing it sort of context that it's funny yeah. but when you see it on the in the ot3 course room it's very deadly serious and you really buy it and then when you get out and you look back and you're like yeah it's really funny you know and then the further away from it you get the more you react like, what was I thinking? And then, you know, a few weeks later, it's what the hell was I thinking? And then a few weeks later, it was like, oh my God, I got, so you sort of, it's, it's a strange slow yeah. motion train wreck yeah. to get out of that thinking, but it always cracks me up. You know, I, I hear a couple of people say, yeah, I opened the pack and I, and I said, this is crazy. I'm out of here. And like, I, more power to them. Uh, but that was not, you know, I, I really did buy it. But to, to speak to your question, um, I, I definitely believed in past lives. I mean, I, I before Scientology, yeah, uh, I believed that the reality that we create is mostly created internally by us, and that it's things that make up the universe are not totally physical. Like I always had that feeling, and then Scientology really perverts and distorts those kinds of concepts and as a as a, a species we're still discovering like what the universe is made out of like that's an ongoing story l ron hubbard he he wrapped that story up and supposedly handed it to us in a bow and we all bought it so i i don't believe that the world is all physical so i don't know is he going to come back i don't know are we going to live forever i can tell you one thing that Scientologists do, because I know, because I did this myself, in terms of settling your own emotions. You always had this, this thing where you could say, well, next lifetime. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, like, like oh, you know. That's, that's what I would think when I'm like, okay, well, I can't go off and, and be an artist or do any sort of artistic thing in the Sea Org this time. Okay, whatever. I'll do it next time around. And it was the same thing with kids. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to have kids. I accepted that early on. I'm like, oh, I'll do it next time. Whatever. I'll yeah. Do yeah. I, I, I have know. plenty of time. There's plenty of time to do what you want. Yeah. And it's a tough thing. To, it's a really actually a tough thing to deal with when you're out and you're like, no, nah, maybe I got 10 years left. I better make the best of it. Cause I don't yeah. know what's going to happen. Yeah, Nobody exactly. does. You know, there's this wonderful exactly. song that I actually got permission from the, uh, the, the writer, uh, her name's Iris Dement. I, it was used on on it was used on one season of The Leftovers as a, as a title sequence. It's called "Let the Mystery Be." She and this woman, I highly recommend you listen to the song Iris Dement. You can look her up. The song is called "Let the Mystery Be," and uh, I, I should have had the lyrics pulled up. But this became my anthem in 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 the years that I was leaving Scientology because uh, it really did take years. And basically, she was in a, a charismatic Christian cult like uh, in the South, I believe it was kind of the way I've heard her describe it. And she was brought up in a, you know, one of these kind of speaking in tongues sort of Southern yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christian, uh, they call them charismatic Christian. Uh, and so she wrote this song. She's a wonderful singer. She's a, like a traditional American singer, not country Western, not folk. She's real traditional American, uh, which everybody calls country. But Basically, the theme of the song is, you know, everybody's wondering what's going to happen when the whole thing's done. And she says, you know, it's all the same to me. I'm just going to let the mystery be. And that was her kind of anthem on leaving her religion. Yeah. And it's really had a powerful effect on me. Uh, that and seeing Miscavige beat his staff. Yeah, I'm sure. But ideologically, that song really had a, a huge effect on me. Yeah, music uh, does that to me, too. Yeah, I wish I could play it for you all, but I, it, you know, there's that, that YouTube thing. She she gave me Iris. She her publisher gave me permission to excerpt uh, some of the lyrics, uh, uh, which I used uh, to head a chapter in my book because it's really, it's like there's nothing wrong with letting that mystery be. You yeah. you know, Scient Scientology 
tells you right on their webpage, we have the answers to life's biggest questions. Like it, it's literally there. Who are you? Where are you going? Where did you come from? And it, it's, it's, so you, you, your, your path forward in terms of discovering your own identity, it stops right there because it's yeah. like, no, it's here. And it's really ridiculous. So when I, I heard her, her words and she said, you know, everybody's worried about this. Everybody's got these questions. I'm just going to let it be. And then all of a sudden you're free. It's a, it's almost a Buddhist in its approach that, you know, Scientology wants to do everything it can to build up your ego and uh, while stealing your identity. Uh, and you know, you're much better off becoming disentangled from your ego. So anyway, I did, that's yeah, my piece. Yeah, it tries to make you think that you're the upper tenth of the upper tenth of 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 the elite of planet Earth. That's what the that's what. Yeah, the absolutely, is. absolutely. <laughs> and then you come out and you're like, wait a second, I'm just. Yeah. I'm just. Well, I I always used to refer to it as uh, Earth, just like everyone else. Exactly. I use I always refer to it as a as a finishing school for for a narcissist because you know, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, yeah it's true. like yeah. It's a good place to go and get an asshole transplant because uh, <laughs> pretty much that's what happens to you. So, yeah, so I spent a lot of time in the building that you worked in, but, you know. I probably um, even ran into you once or twice. Yeah, I'm sure we passed because the elevators, you want to describe the elevator at the HGB? <laughs> so. Okay, so the elevator. Okay, so there's supposedly, okay, so there's four elevators for a 12-story building. One of them, one of them is the freight elevator that hasn't been, that hasn't had an upgrade in many years, breaks down all the time. Um, one of them is basically Miscavige's elevator, but then OSA uses it because it goes straight to OSA, it goes straight to the 11th floor. It's used for, for, for professionals. You're not supposed to use that one. And this is a building right. of 600 people. Right. And then there's supposedly two passenger elevators. So it's two passenger elevators. So one of them broke down and... And for years, they didn't spend the money to fix it. And so the, you know, quote, engineer in the in the HGB would cannibalize parts from that elevator to keep the other one going. Right. <laughs> and at one point, at one point when I worked in the galley, which is the kitchen for the whole building, right? I I think what floor is that on the galley? It's on, on the, the sixth floor. Fifth floor, sixth floor, sixth right. Floor. So at one point when I worked, <laughs> when I worked there, none of the elevators worked except the osa miscavige pro elevator right and we weren't supposed to use that one to to we weren't supposed to use that elevator now the the food for the building is is essentially not i don't want to say catered but it's brought in from the pack base it's yeah made the pack base and it's brought it's, to the AP. it's trucked in <laughs> yeah so we didn't have an elevator for several months and oh we were God. using people there, there have to be a couple of strong guys who were in trouble, who were on the decks in trouble doing <laughs> ethics program. They used to carry these these catering boxes. I don't know if you've seen like these these boxes you use for catering. They would carry them up the back stairwell, six flights of stairs, yeah. <laughs> three times a day. I because we rarely, couldn't use the exec yeah. elevator. Yeah, no, the and but they were really spacious, weren't they, Catherine? The, what, the elevators? No, yeah, the they were really small. <laughs> they were like maybe. No one's like ever four asked me about the HGB elevators before. This is great. Yeah, no, I know. I just I I end up breaking up all the really stupid shit. But they were like. No, maybe, I think it's great. It's, it's yeah, the, it was just so ridiculous because they could have just they could have just spent the money and upgraded the elevators and they would have run yeah, just fine yes. and they could have kept the freight elevator yeah. going. But no, it was one guy who wasn't even like certified for anything. He was yeah. just smart at figuring things out. And so yeah. he would keep the elevators going. And every time anything broke down, he would be in so much trouble for it. Yeah, Somebody man. went to the RPF over the elevators. I'm not surprised. I mean, you you just brought up an interesting point that Scientology needs to have uh, uh, organizations need to have people in trouble or they'd have nobody they yeah. could order to carry the food up and down. That's the right. That's I would right. never take that. Nobody that, that would have been posted in the kitchen either. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I. That's how I, I ended in, up there. What's that? That's how I ended up working in the kitchen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, but anyway, the, the, the elevator, you could maybe, you could maybe fit five people comfortably, but they, the, like 10 people would cram into them. Yeah, that's right. Especially so, in the morning. Yeah. 
in the morning yeah, when it was... comes at the last minute because they didn't get any sleep. And so they try to sleep. Yeah. Minute. And you know, it was the most human contact anybody people got. Try to take the bus to get in. And then they all try to get upstairs because Muster's on the sixth floor. And they all try to take the elevators. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, oh I, the, num the number of times that I was, in, I mean, I was in the building hundreds, and hundreds of times, uh, or, you know, the, also, I didn't like driving up to gold. So towards in the later years I was there, I either got somebody to drive me or I told them I wouldn't work there or I would drop my car off at the HGB in the parking lot. And then I would take the run up, which was oh, the van yeah. Yeah. that you, you talked about, uh, which would go up there twice a day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would rarely take the elevator because, you know, I grew up in California and my father was an architect and he did a lot of work, uh, like earthquake work. And, and he, for years and years and years, he used to, he tried to get a, a, an ordinance passed that they couldn't build buildings taller than six stories in Los Angeles. Cause he said, look, the whole place is just going to fall into the earth at some point. <laughs> right. Why, you know, how many people yeah. do you want to kill? Yeah. But although he worked on engineering for skyscrapers and stuff, but. Um, just because of that, becoming aware of all that and living through, I lived through some pretty horrific, the worst of the Southern California earthquakes we've had so far. You know, there's two kind of people in Southern California. There's people that have been stuck in an elevator or they're going to be stuck in an elevator. <laughs> and it's like, uh, I mean, I remember like being there with Miscavige and I've just looked at him and I said, I'll take the stairs. And he looked at me like I'm crazy. And I said, sir. If there's an earthquake, you're going to be thinking, fucking Mitch was really smart. So <laughs> anyway, I literally would like just take the stairs because I, th those elevators just scared the shit out of me. Oh, and I, you know, I, I, I spent weeks getting suck checked there. On the, what is that on the fourth floor? I think. Yeah, was, uh, that's right. Yeah. So I had to walk up those elevators. Uh, who, who, who sec checked you? Did Joan Diskin sec check you? No. What's her name? She's married to Bob, the football player. Uh, oh, Adams, Rachel. Yeah, Rachel, she's yeah. nice. I like her. Rachel's a nice yeah, person. Is, she is nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're talking Rachel like we're we're talking <laughs> as you know, as people who eat their young go. So you know, so uh, anyway, Rachel she, was she, my roommate before she was married to Bob. Actually, oh really? Yeah, yeah, they're an interesting couple of people. We're we're just off into this. Like, I know, no one this knows. Is like <laughs> you know, we ran into each other at Starbucks and we're like, oh yeah, I should have known you. And now we're talking, and everybody, right. in the, everybody in the Starbucks is listening. All forty-two of them. Anyway, mm -hmm. hope we're not boring you guys. But um, yeah, that's pretty much the deal. So yeah, I spent a lot of time in that building. I mean, because I I did the. Uh, the LRH Life Exhibition, which is not something I would, that's not a good piece of work. Uh, if you want to see my best work, go see the Industry of Death Museum because that's. I worked on the renovations for the industry. Yeah, I know. Chris Sheldon did too. You did? Yeah. yeah. Did I you? wasn't I, in the RPF, but I was. I yeah, just, so did Chris. I busted from data and I needed something to do. And so I, I, I wasn't on the RPF. I was just in trouble, in ethics trouble. And so I went and did renovations there. Yeah. So, could you imagine that there was like, I'm sorry? For a few weeks, I was there. Yeah. Uh, could you imagine there was a meeting and it was like, okay, we have to up the workforce to get this thing done. So, like, who were we going to throw into the RPF? <laughs> it's like, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, and, if, and if, they couldn't have, I guess they, they couldn't, because they had contractors, they couldn't have CERG members and all these random people working in the daytime because they right violated right. something with their contractors working with the construction right right well because they, they have unions, unions yeah so so yeah. then everybody would have to work at night so you'd have all the sea org members and volunteers and whoever working working right. all night <laughs> trying to now, when whatever. were you were when were so it opened on december 17th 2005 i believe yeah uh and i don't know how i remember that it was the anniversary of a dear friend of mine's death and um, I, I, it's you know it was the end of me not sleeping for six weeks. Uh, but do you remember what when it was you were working on it? Because renovations were going on for a while. I was on it from uh, beginning of fall, maybe late September, early October, until it opened. Oh, what I was doing on the renovations? No, when? What? What was your time oh, when frame when you was, were working um, on it? I think it was October. It was like October, yeah, so November. Yeah, so I, I saw you there. You yeah. were like in, I, you were the one in the blue grubbies with a hammer. Wait a minute, that was everybody. So. <laughs> yeah, that was everyone. <laughs> <laughs> or a crowbar, or a. Actually, yeah. I, I actually I ended up I I started working on renovations and then I ended up, um, being in charge of food and and keeping everyone going. 
So I kind of somehow moved into that. And then they decided to post me in the galley afterwards. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. 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 Boy, that, that galley. Oh my God. Um, yeah. We had the same food at SMP that you guys had. Yeah. yeah. Except you guys were one stop closer than we were to the kitchen. <laughs> we, we used to drive the, 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 the guy who ran the galley and the, and the H should be, his name was Chris. Who's the chief steward. Uh -huh. He he used to drive the food to SMP. You probably saw yeah. him unloading the food for SMP. Yeah, I'm sure because they, they didn't have a kitchen there. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's, that's why Gold was everybody wanted to work at Gold because you know they had yeah they had the pretty decent food, food and they yeah. had a, a big because we, we actually started. before we with, there was a whole merge that was done when 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 Ty Webb came and did the whole mm. LA org thing and then he right. moved to the HGB. Right. There was a whole merge of the galleys done. Because we used to have our own set of cooks and our own menu and menu planning and everything. And we just used to use the pack kitchen and kind of coordinate with them and do our thing and they would do their thing. And then he came along and said, no, everything should be done together. And the quality of our food dropped significantly. Yeah. 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 I can imagine it would. Yeah. Uh, people may not know who Ty Webb was. You might want to just tell them. Um, Ty Webb was is. or is still an RTC staff member, believe it or not, because he was involved in the whole Chase Wave thing. And when the Chase Wave exploded, um, he was down in Africa opening up the advanced org in Africa and he just stayed there. In Africa, <laughs> he never came back. Interesting. Interesting. He was like, he was like the big the big uh, honcho, he was like, because because you'd have these waves of like, you know, ideal org unit, or you have this or that person who's now like favored by Miscavige, who's like in charge of everything, and they're going to sort out management, get the ideal orgs going, get this or that going. Yeah. And they would be going, doing good for a while, and then they would they would get busted or something would happen, and they would just disappear. Yeah. And this happened yeah. so many times over the years. It was like, Bob and Laurent, you probably knew Bob and Laurence, Bob Wright and uh, Laurence. Laurence. Oh, yeah. I knew I knew Laurence for years. Uh, yeah. But in, when she was before, yeah, they took off together and then got married. No, I knew her when she was Laurence Stumpke. And then yeah. that's mostly what I, I knew her. Mar when she was married to John married. Stumpke, who was actually yeah, one, of the, one of the people who did the, the C, who was the gold. He was, he was in gold and he was working on the, the CCHR museum actually he was one of the yeah people. he was uh i worked with him a lot he was uh, on the crew we, we got a long time yeah. uh he's he was spent some time in the hole and blah 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 and some of these people it's just like man they just they need to find their way out of there because they're yeah. just like, yeah they really do they're just inherently not bad people i mean there's there's i've never met i i met a ton of really smart really nice people who were serial numbers i met a ton of people that were dumb as a bag of hammers <laughs> and were just, you know, would just follow orders. And then some people who were just bad to the bone, mean, nasty people. Yeah. So it's it's definitely not a monolithic group at all. Yeah. Yeah. There's all sorts of people. I, I, yeah. I experienced definitely the same thing over the years. There's like the people who love just being in an exact position so they could be nasty to everyone and yell at them. Yeah. All the time and yeah. Lord yeah. Over them. And then there was people who, who, generally uh, genuinely cared about people and wanted their staff to do well and they'd end up in an exact position you're like wow i have a really cool senior <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i know there's there's some there. people i mean like mike render who was the first person i worked in i worked for outside of films because i went up there to do tech films and then the, one of the first projects i did outside of that was the lrh the l run Hebrew life ex exhibition uh which was a complete disaster it was going off a cliff. It was really horrible. And then I was asked to go in. I think I worked on it for uh, uh, over half a year, uh, making films and designing the exhibits. I mean, the one part of it that I wanted to tear out, I tore a lot of it out, oh. or I got a lot of it torn out and redone. The one thing I wanted to tear out, they, they'd spend all this money on this automatronic, life-size display of from Mission Earth. Yeah, a know. battlefield Earth, rather. Sorry, yeah, yeah. and it was the you know the character that Travolta played, and then the the the, the, the hero. But they were like robots. They were like had those funky moves, and they were yeah. like you know about to do battle, and they they just paid a fortune for it. And they wouldn't get rid of it. But and this is before the the Battlefield Earth movie was made. But it, I wish there was you know I don't know if that thing's still around, but it's like this testament. It's like a tribute to how bad the film is going to be. So, because <laughs> yeah. they actually managed to build this this diorama, automatronic, like 
you know, like like they were trying to do a Disney thing with Abe Lincoln. Right? Uh, it's so bad. Anyway, I could I just cringe when I I, I could I really I wanted to tear it out of there. I'm like, this is just, what. Did, this what did you think of the Battlefield Earth movie when it came out? Did you think it was? Uh, I, to I, I don't have words to describe that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I thought the tech films that that were done before I was there were weren't bad enough. You mm -hmm. had to figure out a way to make a whole feature film that was that horrible. I mean, it was horrific. You know, I couldn't ever really speak my mind about it. But, yeah. you know, my actual, if you want my analysis, like when I was in it, I guess even still now, it's a pot boiler. Do you know what a pot boiler is? I mean, it's basically yeah, a piece boring. of entertainment that is designed and intended by the creator to cater to popular tastes and that's the only reason it exists whether it's a book or a movie and there's a lot of pot boilers right um that's what everybody thought star wars was going to be and then it took the world by storm yeah uh and i think l ron hubbard was always jealous of that as because of his science fiction work so he wanted to create he created a pot boiler because that thing was just meant to to cater to public what he thought public taste was and he didn't have very good taste possibly if they got a really good script writer and then broke that book up into four sections and then did it as a limited TV series because when they put the movie out, it was when television was starting to take on that role of doing multi-part serialized uh, either historical dramas or like science fiction kind of stuff. You know, it's the same thing I always thought they should have done with Dune. I mean, at least now Dune is being serialized as a motion picture, but you know, the, the, like, why not do, could you imagine they do four or six episodes? And it's a much better way yeah, to do it. you could it. actually tell the whole story because they, Yeah, and, and if you had a really good story. So badly. Yeah, really badly. And it's Butcher not the, the story, worst. Butcher the characters. You're just like. Yeah, what, it was never my cup of tea. Story? But I, I like I, the story. Like, I love reading science fiction. And I, I've yeah. read that, that book, like, several times. I listened to the audio book. And I really yeah, like the movie. Either. And I'm like. They butchered the story. Yeah, it was not they really the story. did. They really did. Well, I, I remember not long after it came out, um, I went. I was invited to like a post premiere, you know, meet and greet at author services, like a party, and all, execs were there. A bunch of Hollywood people were there. And yeah. uh, what is his name? Roger Christensen. Is that his name? Who directed it? I think that's I his name. Help me in the chat, people. Uh, <laughs> I think it's Roger Christensen. And he never really apologized. I think he he sort of accepted his his what do they call it the award for the worst movie Razzie. He accepted uh, yeah. his he graciously accepted his Razzie award. The guy who wrote the screenplay made a public apology for having written the the, the worst movie ever, however he put it. But he basically said that. And I remember meeting Roger Christensen. I think it was the first feature he did. He was out of the art department, like he was a production designer. And I spoke with him, like we had a lengthy conversation. He was a really nice guy. But I kept having this conversation with myself at the same time thinking, oh, I get why they hired this guy because they could, he's the kind of guy you could give orders to. Like he's the kind of guy that, that like they couldn't hire like a Ridley Scott because he would say, yeah, okay, I'll do it, but it's my movie, F off. Like, you're not going to tell me how to make it. But Roger Christensen was, he was, a, to me, he, he came off like a kind of guy who would listen to, uh, you know, uh, uh, a committee led by David Miscavige, that who, you know, I'm sure reviewed footage from the film and weighed in and probably talked to John and then gave Roger notes and da da da. Because he, he just seemed like a very malleable, jovial kind of like, he wasn't like an intense artist who was, going to take Hubbard's work and then make his own vision out of it, which is how you make a good film. So did you, did you hear how Miscavige was like, was like giving directions every single day on that film? I did. I heard about that. Yeah, I, I, I suspected it when it was awesome. happening. And then I heard it later. Mike and... tells, it, tells a good story about that, how he was, he was giving these very sp specific directions he would like get the shots for the day and then he would like give all this tell all this stuff to John so that John could <laughs> yeah. tell the director. And he was doing this like very meticulously, like all through the movie. And yeah. Just, and, and he would brag about how this is going to be the greatest thing for Scientology. This is going to be the greatest movie, blah, blah, blah. And then when it tanked, when it did really badly, oh my God. Was, there was a conversation that happened 
that Mike that Mike witnessed between between Miscavige and Tom Cruise, where Tom Cruise is like, "What the hell with Battlefield Earth, Dave?" And 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 Miscavige says, "Yeah, John Travolta is just out ethics. He's 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 so out ethics. He just." throws john under the bus for the whole oh, yeah. thing after yeah, he's not surprising. The giving all after yeah no that's not surprising at all that he would do that it's just yeah. like you know i think possibly because uh john has i don't you know his private life is yeah. in, integrated with the the political mindset of scientology the social political mindset yeah. that they he's not they're not friends you know it's just yeah. like he doesn't give a shit about john Gosh, where yeah. where where tom has great value to him as a yeah. you know he's worth controlling and being friends with right so yeah it was pretty crazy so yeah i did know i i know about it not specifically i mean i was so busy making films keep in mind while he's giving roger christian notes roger christensen notes about, about battle of the Earth. he's giving me notes about the technical training films but he wasn't he was i mostly just got approvals and stuff because yeah. I mean, when I first went up there, uh, the crew was locked in the galley, literally, like 10 hours a day. They were scrubbing out the, the grease out of the fryer. They weren't allowed to go to their equipment. I didn't know this. They'd been all busted and sent into the galley. And then Miscavige put out this order to find a professional director. And I had done the work on the Dianetics campaign in L.A. and had all the success. So then they, you know, kind of seduced me into coming up there and directing a film. And then, you know, he stuck the film i got it done in under two and a half weeks which no one had ever done and that's the hubbard mandated um time frame for finishing a film is two and a half weeks i didn't know about that i finished in under two and a half weeks and all of a sudden as i've described it to others i felt like you know the explorer who crash landed on a primitive island and the, na the you know the the native people were like picking you up and like you're like a god or something i'm like whoa what happened what just happened and then somebody <laughs> somebody from hco said you know came over and said you got to go look at the org board and i'm like huh so i went over and i looked at the org board in where hco is and right at the top of the cine division right under the divisional secretary was my name <laughs> oh, wow. on the freaking org board okay yeah. so if if voodoo was a real thing and miscavige had taken a voodoo doll of mitch brisker and stabbed it through the heart onto the org board that would have been about the same thing because wow. you know how hard it is to get off an org board. Yeah. I would have had yeah. to leave Scientology, like if I wanted to stop working there. So then it began this long odyssey of how am I going to deal with this as a true believing Scientologist? So I ended up doing a lot of films, but uh, so it went from everything was micromanaged at the beginning. Like I worked with the crew, Jackson Moorhead made sure yeah. that they all called me sir and Mr. Brisker and nobody messed with me and blah, 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 blah. And which I, I was like, it was weird because I'm like, why are these people like, eh, they don't need to do, you know, they don't, you know, yeah. you, you can call me sir on the set because that's not unheard of. But, you know, when I run into you at dinner, like, I don't call me sir. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Like you're talking to my father, right? <laughs> so, but every aspect of the film, the casting, the set design, uh, a, a lengthy proposal for me about how I intended to make it interpreted onto the screen. All of these things would have to be submitted to him for approval. Costumes, camera planning, like intense planning. And I, I would say within five or six years of my being there, uh, whenever it was, whenever the, it was, whenever the, the uh, what's her name? Oh, God, I can't remember her name. You know, the, the girl who died at Flag. Oh, my oh yes. Stacy. Huh? Are you talking about... Uh, no, you know, the one who the big flap, the big court case, the, oh, God, I'm embarrassed that I I can't remember it. Who, he, he died, the one who was walking down the street naked, and they picked her up. And Oh, yeah, like, sorry. I thought you meant the girl who died at Flag. Or I'm not, I'm sorry, Gold. I thought you meant the, never mind. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah I know I know who you mean. This Pearson, a few Lisa does. McPherson. <laughs> yeah, Lisa McPherson. I, uh, may you rest in peace. I'm so sorry. I couldn't remember your name. When, by the time that whole thing happened, and Miscavige was, had to spend all that time in Clearwater, um, he sent me a note that said, just send me finished films. This was a huge deal. Like this was every day he would look at the rushes at the dailies. Every day I'd write the, the dailies up as a proposal and send it to him. And every day, you know, he'd look at every shot. 
in in the theater. And then I would usually run into him and we'd talk about them. And then he'd send me my proposal back. So it was a lot of stuff. I mean, he told me I was walking through the RTC offices with him one day before the their $50 million building was built. I don't know why I was up there because I rarely ever went up there, but we were walking into his office and he walked by the filing cabinets where all the traffic is. The traffic is correspondence that goes back and forth between any person in Scientology and the chairman of the board, quote unquote, uh, for an organization that doesn't even have a board of directors. I don't know how you can be chairman of the board. We walked by these files and he like thumbed them and said, hey, Mitch, do you know that there's more traffic in there between you and me than between me and anybody else in the world? Now, I don't know if that was true, but he could have been just saying that to like, you know, you I know wonder what I'm what he's going to think of you like speaking out and doing. He's not going to be happy about it. This stuff. Yeah. But then he should, there were certain things he shouldn't, he did that I wasn't happy with. So, and, and if yeah. he wants to discuss them, I'm totally open to having a conversation about it. So, I mean, yeah, I'd be willing to give you a, I'm sure he's not. I mean, the last letter I got from him was in 2018 and he referred to me as a good friend. So I went through a lot of machinations to realize that I needed to, when that I, even, e even that I was being manipulated. Yeah. When did I leave? No. When did you start and when did you leave? Oh, I started in, it's a, that's a long story. I, the interviews on, I mean, mine's bloody and gory. Um, <laughs> it really, my, my, my yeah. backstory, my uh, origin story, everybody has an origin story, right? It's the, yeah. uh, the second gens are all, you know, they were born in. So they all have that. Like Aaron Smith Levin, his entire origin story is the name of his YouTube channel. But there's a lot of painful details that go along yeah. with that. So I'm not like trying to make less of that. But for us, first gens who, like myself, who sort of uh, were seduced into Scientology, uh, th their stories are very different. I mean, I was, okay, I was a 23-year-old heroin addicted film school dropout and a celebrity director who I had worked with. My girlfriend had just died of an overdose and he thought he just started doing Scientology and he thought it could help me. So he brought me in a celebrity center. That's the short version. Wow. I've told the longer version over uh, many times and the rest of it's in my book at great detail. And so that was it for me. And so, you know, six weeks later, I was off drugs at, and I was going back to college and then I started my career. And I was kind of like still doing some Scientology and stuff and. And I'd go up the bridge when I could. I had time. I had money. I was working as a commercial director. And uh, they then they knew about me. Now you can connect that with the, the crew being in the galley. Yeah. You know, I've left out a lot of time, like 20 years, but the crew being in the galley and them really desperate because keep in mind, uh, just I, I hope I'm not boring anybody because I've told this story before, but in 1963, L. Rudd Hubbard, he did a filmed lecture. He did a lot of filmed lectures at yeah. St. Hill, and including the OT films, which uh, I did an episode with Chris Shelton on, because I, I was I restored all those films, so I'm really familiar with them. Um, and and those are the films that, that they are the most, they should be the most afraid of not leaking, because if one of those film lectures of him teaching people on the OT level, specifically OT2 and what's called the clearing course for those who don't go clear in Dianetics, it would be the end of Scientology if anybody saw those. Hub yeah, because there's no more question that he was batshit crazy. Then when you watch those films, you'd be like, there it is, folks. You yeah, know, when I it. found out what the OT levels were, and this is before I left the Sea Org, I found right. a lot of stuff before I left. Um, you okay? I found out what the OT levels were. I, you, I just, are you okay? You didn't get too sick, did you? Just a no. little maybe? <laughs> You know, I was scared for years that something bad was going to happen to me because I happened to see the word Xenu in some report or something. And for years, I was like afraid something was going to happen to me. But then anyway, so I, I had I had seen uh, I, I found out what the OT levels were and what the clear cognition was before I left Scientology. Right. I left the Sea Org. And I was like, oh, this just took a hard left turn into, yeah. I don't know what, like the, like the earlier stuff and the, in the, in the lower levels and the grades. I'm like, okay, this all kind of makes, sort of makes sense. You know, I've done a lot yeah, of in some way it's helpful. Yeah. And then, but then it takes this hard left, right turn, yeah. whatever, into the whole body Thetan, this, all this <laughs> yeah. crap. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. And then I found out what the truth rundown was. And then I was like, no, I'm never going to do that. And then, oh, there's no OT nine or nine or ten. Oh, you mean truth oh, went on the oh, article? 
You mean the uh, audit? No, no, no. The, the, the actual auditing called the truth. Yeah. Went down. I had it. You did? Oh my yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I survived. It was like, yeah, I survived. But then um, they try to tell you, okay, you didn't see, you didn't observe what you observed. It was because yeah. of your Oh, yeah. That's what you, and I'm like, no. Yeah. Mm -mm, oh, yeah. I mean, that. if, 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 no. if the Puritans, I mean, Scientology has, they've brought shaming, public shaming and brainwashing into the 22nd century. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. amazing. Like, anyway, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I did the, I had the truth run down. It, I, it was like whatever. And I had it from Marty Rappin. So I had it, I had it from the best. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So oh I, I get, I get like a, I get, we should have SP Nation like campaign bars. <laughs> like, you know, like the Sea Org, they have all these, yeah. they have yeah. all these campaign bars. I, yeah. you know, there should be the one that you got the truth rundown. And then if it has a little gold star on it, then you got it for Marty Rath. But you know. <laughs> okay. yeah, I, I used to, I just got to say, I just, I used to love listening to David Miscavige. You know how, like when, when people get in trouble, all of a sudden you hear all this stuff about them, yeah, bad yeah, stuff. Yeah, like yeah. they were, yeah. Oh, like yeah, a, they were involved in this or that, or they're responsible for this or. Oh yeah. No, but he head. was, he was like really amazing with it. Like, like, especially a gold, it was like, I remember this woman who, when I first went up there, helped kind of onboard me, you know, get me set up and read some policies and, you know, get me a, you know, a 12 button phone and all this crazy stuff. And then she like left, she blew escape slash escape. And then all of a sudden, oh, she, she had sex with her father, you know, all of a sudden, all of this yeah. stuff, yeah. you'd hear about them. And my favorite Marty one was once when Miss Gavage said, about how crazy Marty was and that his mother, this is so horrible. Even if this was true, how could you repeat it? His, she had been electroshocked while he was in her womb. Yeah. That Marty's mother, this was one of the, why would you even, why, what would make somebody even like repeat, repeat that, that if it was true? Yeah, I know. It was the craziest stuff. And, and then he, cause he told me this, we were having a conversation about it when Marty was making all that trouble. Yeah. And uh, he said, yeah, you know, fucking Marty, you know, the, the previous time he had left, escaped, he'd gone to New Orleans and Miscavige had tracked him down and showed up in New Orleans with a pair of tickets to like uh, an impossible to get into baseball game because they were both sports fans. And, and he told me about this whole bromance that they had, this like two day bromance where, you know, Dave had like seduced Marty back in and then, you know, he said, yeah. And then I, I sent him to the mill to work to make build furniture at flag for a while. I paid all his medical bills and then I sent him to the ship for a year. Like he was just like some hero. And then the guy just messed him over. He, he, he really like plays the victim thing more than you can imagine it, which is right out of the psychopathy of a narcissist. Cause you know, a narcissist will do something bad to somebody and then can't feel the guilt. So then when they see that person, they convert that guilt into something that that person is doing to them. And that's just kind of how it works. So like, that's why he told me I'm never coming back here because, you know, too many people effed me over at this base. So. Wow. Did you ever read the uh, sociopath next door? I did. I, and I did. Great. And then I found out everybody read it. And I'm like, I know I read two my the first two books I read because I wound up in a this is so bizarre but when I really made the decision to leave I wound up in a relationship with a woman who was never been a Scientologist but she was a complete sociopathic narcissist and it, it because you're primed to it, you need to really do a lot of work or you're primed to fall into similar situations yeah. right it, it's just a fact I'm telling you you know like when Mark and Claire left gold, they had a great relationship. Uh, so there was, you know, that was one of the things that really led to their success and other people. There yeah. are some couples that managed to leave together. Uh, and then there's couples that managed to leave and find good partners. And then there's people like me that ended up hooking up with somebody who love bombed them into a relationship and then went, went through the whole cycle, but fortunately within a few months, not a few decades. So I'd read a book about uh, females 
a covert narcissist. Yeah. And then, and I thought they'd wrote, written it about this person. Like literally, I'm like, yeah. I kept looking in the back for her name. Like, did you know this person? I was freaked me out. And that sort of started me on a path of exploration to find out more about this. And when I read The Psychopath Next Door, I thought the same thing. Did they, they knew David Miscavige. They wrote this book about yeah, him. That's I mean, right. That's it, right. And other people, other, other execs I've known uh, over the years. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, but under oh, his, that's that person right there. Yeah. I'm like, did they know, they must've known him. I just, just, you know, anyway, that was, that was like when I read, um, um, combat, combating cult mind control by Steve Hassan. When I first, yeah, came I did out, not read that, like, but I've listened. Uh, I was like, yeah. this guy's talking about Scientology. I was like, yeah. this guy is talking <laughs> about Scientology. I was so yeah. like, wow. Yeah. Woo, okay. Yeah, yeah. I see uh, Chris Shelton's uh, in the Oh, yeah, Chris Shelton's in here. That's great. Yeah. Hey, he, Chris, just you should know, he's one of the first people I spoke with when I got out. I oh, think I, well, I watched I think a I, lot of his interviews and a lot of his yeah, interviews to yeah. help me. He's really helped to, to decode a lot of this stuff yeah. for us. He's actually played it was, a really. It was his big video. Role. His video about the truth rundown that that was one of the like turning points for me as far as my, my yeah. decision. I'm like, because first I was like, okay, I want to leave the Sea Org, but I want to stay in Scientology. And then I was like, okay, well, and then I was like, I, I need to decide if I'm gonna if I'm gonna stay with Scientology or not. Because if I'm not gonna stay in Scientology, I'm just gonna leave. I'm not gonna tell anybody I'm gonna leave. I'm just gonna figure right. out and go and go. Otherwise, it's like the whole route out. They'd send me back to L.A. Sec checks, blah blah blah, yeah. right? So Painful. when I saw Chris's video on the truth rundown, I was like, okay, I don't think yeah. I have anything to do with this yeah. anymore. Yeah. I I know. And I was like, and the upper levels, I'm not interested in that. Clear cognition, okay, that doesn't really that doesn't really do it for me. What you get to the end, oh, you were just you were just mocking up your whole reactive yeah. mind. Yeah. Uh, exactly. You get to the end of the OT levels and it's yeah. like, oh. You know, everything, every, all of your memories were, were just body thetan incidents or whatever it is. And you're like, wow. Okay. What did I just, what did I just waste my time doing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, guaranteed by the time you've gone through any OT levels, especially up to OT, whatever your actual true core identity is, it's, it doesn't exist anymore and you're, yeah. you're going to have to find it. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really glad I didn't do any of that. And I'm yeah, glad you, you were I, lucky. I didn't go. Lucky. I, I get another campaign badge. I think you get them for OT levels. You get them for getting the truth run down. You get a gold star. It was from Marty. And then I also had. You uh, get one for working at the end base too. Yeah. For, yeah, you do. I want to, I want to ring. Where's my ring. I mean, I. You know, I you was, know they stopped doing the 25 year rings. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Because I think because they cost too much, they stopped. And like a few years before I was going to get my 25 year ring, they stopped doing the oh, rings. No. And they started I doing thought it was pins. because <laughs> I they thought it was because pins. too many of them showed up on uh, eBay. I actually have my pin, my 25. Do you? Yeah. yeah, I didn't get nothing. I got a, a baseball jacket. There was a time that Miss <laughs> Gavage made the. No, literally, there were these really coveted. I'm going to wear it. On, a, on, a, on the, my next stream, I'm going to wear my gold baseball jacket. It's a really expensive, like, uh, you know, baseball jacket with this yeah. gaudy, huge Golden Era Productions logo on the back. And then he had patches made for each technical training film that you worked on. So, of course, I got a jacket with all of them. I never had them sewn on, but I, I, I should and just wear it. It's just, it's, <laughs> you know, it's really crazy. But that's all I got. I spent... 28 years there and all I got was a stupid baseball jacket. Yeah. Pe people were really upset when they stopped doing the rings. I'll bet. They were like, what the yeah. hell? I always, I used to see those rings and I thought, you know, those would be good in a fight. They were like brass knuckles. You know, <laughs> I was expecting to see some guy with a 25 year indent in his forehead. Yeah. It, they even was, made him like smaller and like not as, as annoying. They made him look much better. And then they stopped. Oh, well, doing that's it. good. And they, it's like I guess it, it, it cost too much because it cost too much because there was too many people that were in the Sea Org for twenty five years. Like it just it is they didn't want to spend the money on it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, the fact that they didn't just give them to you as an award was yeah. really pretty disgusting. And then they came out with this whole thing from it management PR. Excuse me, <coughs> this whole thing about how a pin is like so much better and like this whole like <laughs> they tried to do this whole pr handling and it didn't work everyone was like where the hell is my ring <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> Hold on here one second. Oh, oh yeah. you're gonna get something. I'm gonna get my pen. I'll show you the pen. Yeah, Hold on. Get your pen. Please get your pen. Uh, so just stand by, folks. Uh, Catherine and I are gonna do a little show and tell. Did I tear my entire house up? Oh, here it is. Did you find it? I did. Okay, here we go. This is very impromptu, folks. <laughs> this is, uh, let me see, how do I do this? Okay, there you go. Oh, I put it too low. There's my, my Scientology Media Production Senior Director that I could put on a blazer and oh, it would make me, look like a, make me look like a flight attendant. So... <laughs> Okay, so this, this is, is the first the, time I've ever worn it, by the way. This is a campaign bar. I don't remember what it was. Oh, for. nice, nice. Um, you should wear that when you get interviewed. I'm going to start wearing. <laughs> I'm going to wear this my gold the, jacket and my my SMP. Uh, this is. The, I actually the, still have a security card from there. I should wear it. Around. <laughs> what does it say? This is it's the centennial. It says, ISP. "Oh yeah, that's cool. That's Oops. cool." Oh, is, is it blurry? Yeah, this thing is it's, it's starting to burn. It's like molecular acid from uh, Alien. It's starting to burn through my chest. <laughs> this is my rank insignia. Oh, I nice, was, nice. Petty officer. Um, Scientology ring, extremely tarnished. This was my OT necklace. Nice. Which, when the new jewelry came out, they forbade anyone who was not OT from wearing OT symbology, and I was right. so mad. I'm like, I'm in the Sea Org. I'm I'm automatically. An yeah, OT. you're. I an can't OT wear upon, symbology. upon signing, right? Per yeah. L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. So I bought the theta symbol instead. Nice. They nice. Have. And then let's see. This is my IAS pin. Nice. I got one of those somewhere. I think I think my dog ate it. This is the Columbus Ideal Org pin. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. You should put those all in like a shadow box. You know, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this is my extremely there. tarnished twenty-five year pin. Oh, this nice. Is what, nice. This is what they give you now instead of the ring. That is so unattractive. <laughs> It's just like right. hideous. And plus, I was wearing an estates uniform, and so I didn't have anywhere to put it because you're supposed to wear it on your jacket and, like, you know, right. all spiffy. Right. I'm never going to wear it. Thanks. Right, right. So I just thought it was something I want to ask you about. Um, so when you were in, in working in Ohio, when you were in Columbus, right? Yeah. You were working, doing some marketing. Right. Yeah, that's right. So I, I remember I heard the whole story because you know it kind of led you to start looking around. You were doing work on Facebook. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I was curious to hear about that because I know when I was at Gold, we were involved in these campaigns, these ideal or campaigns that we were trying to do these co-op campaigns, where we would put Scientology. The plan was they never did it. Was to run like run the the Scientology as like the Super Bowl ads, to yeah. run them. Let's say a buy in Columbus. And then at the end of the ad, uh, put, you know, you're invited to the Columbus Org or something. In other words, make it specific about the, specific yeah. about that area. And they never followed through on it. I thought it was a great idea when I was in there because to give support to the people because there were people like what you were doing, who were um, trying to do marketing within their area. That's right. I, how did you? That's how right. Were you so, doing that on Facebook. Okay, so I'll start at the beginning. So, Columbus Org. Um, renovations were done for many months and they couldn't open the org because there weren't enough staff. Right. And so with both Columbus and Kansas City, um, they decided to send in a bunch of Sea Org members so they could open the org because this right. was this was uh, after they pulled months after after they pulled all the uh, the ideal org missionaries because of the chase wave and there was no one doing any recruiting. There was no one. There was hardly anyone doing regging. All the all the GI crashed. No one was recruiting for the ideal orgs. And so they had to send Sea Org members out. So right. they ended up 
<clears throat> I ended up going out to Columbus and I ended up in, div in division six, which is the public division for right. people who don't know. And right. I was the director of public promotion and they gave me the non-existence campaign for the org. Right. Um, yeah. That's what we were calling them. The yeah. thing that I was, I just, you're yeah. right. They were, they were the 9A e campaigns for them. Yeah. And we were supposed to provide support materials, which we never did. Yeah. So these were supposedly based on surveys of which I could never find the surveys that were no, done. Because they were never done. <laughs> yeah. And if they were, they were very skimpy and they were done on like, I don't know, some students up at OSU. I, I don't know. I Like I could never figure out what these were based on. So we got all this promotion and we got this this campaign and there was, you know, flyers and handouts and radio ads. And um, we got a TV ad for the org, which was just like show the org and this cool, like fly over fly through thing. And we got all this stuff and I was supposed to um, execute this, you know, find the media companies that we want to use. We use like iHeartRadio. We used uh, the, uh, a TV. We used a TV we did TV ads. We had a TV studio right across the street from the org and we established uh, a, a, a line with um, one of the executives over there became our, our, our friend basically. And he would run our ads and had this whole thing going with him and then book ads and newspaper ads, all this stuff and handouts, lots of handouts, posters, um, all this stuff. But, but the thing is, is that it wasn't, um, it wasn't resulting in very many people coming into the org. So, and I, and so I was always, I was the one who was looked to like, okay, well, what's happening with the campaign? How come we're not getting very many people? Because what was getting more people in was, you know, people contacting people, selling books, uh, contact keeping their contact information of the people you sold books to, and then getting them to come in and do more stuff and all this stuff. But the actual, campaign and the promotion that was being done wasn't resulting in much and i was just perplexed because i was like okay this is a campaign from you know the mystical marketing division <laughs> of smp and it's supposed to work and it's supposedly based around you know l ron hubbard marketing technology and why isn't this working i, I don't get it i don't get why this isn't working and I was trying to learn more of the marketing issues and figure out what was going on. And just, I, I <laughs> it was, it was a mystery to me as to why this wasn't working. And then I started asking like, okay, well, what's working in other orgs? And it was very, very hard to get this question answered. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Mystical marketing. That's right. <laughs> It was very hard to get this question answered. No one would, no one, the, like the communication between the orgs is, is it, it doesn't, it doesn't really flow a lot and you can't really find out, okay, well, what's, what's working in other orgs and nobody can answer that question for me. And then I, I happened to talk to somebody who was in New York, who was in the New York org when the Nani campaign was being done. And she was like, yeah, well, well, our naughty campaign in, in New York didn't really do much. And I was like, okay, well, we're, this is like a $30,000 campaign. Like we, <laughs> we have to do something to, to, to get it going. Right. And then of course, in the middle of all this was COVID. Let me ask you real quick. Did they, were you provided any outside funding or did you have to just fund the whole thing? Internally? No, no, this, the naughty campaign is, is funded for you. Um, but once, and the, and there's specific things that go with a campaign and you're supposed to only use the funding for those specific things and everything's very regulated. So then COVID came in the middle of this and we stopped everything because it's like, we're not going to promote people to come in the org if it's closed. So stop all the ads, stop all the TV, radio, stop it all. Right. And I, I was thinking, well, we could still sell books. So I kept the book ads going. I got in trouble for that, but whatever. Um, I got in trouble for, for advertising books while the org was closed. I'll never forget that. I got in so much trouble. I stayed on the Edie's shit list for like forever after that because of, because I, I, I misused funds or whatever. Well, that would have been the marketing was the perfect thing to do. So of course you were. <laughs> right? For it. right. Exactly. 
<laughs> so so then I was so then I ran these ads during during COVID and and oh you asked about Facebook okay so the thing with Facebook I wanted to to um, see other orgs Facebook pages and see what they did because I heard like how cool the London Facebook page was oh, Alex hi Alex <laughs> and various other orgs that were using social media to promote and I'm like okay if we can work out how to do this we'll probably get a lot more people in. And the only person here that who had access, authorized access to the social media accounts was the DSA. So whatever DSA, Director of Special Affairs, the person over OSA. So whatever I would want to um, put on social media, had to go to her. She had to do the thing with whatever you do with putting it on Facebook. And so in the middle of COVID, I was like, well, I really want to see these other these other Facebook pages. And of course I didn't have Facebook access, so I, I couldn't see them easily. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make a, bo I'm gonna make a, a, a bogus Facebook account. Just like, you know, use my name in like a weird way. So it doesn't look like me just in case anyone sees it or whatever. So then I made this Facebook account so I could go check out these pages. I'm like, Oh, London Facebook. That's really cool. Like they were posting stuff all the time. And it was like this group of, of, of young people in London who were, who were the staff, like the Div 6 staff. And they were like all like doing this, like these cool things to promote the org. And I was like, that's pretty neat. And I was checking out other orgs. And then um, a couple of weeks after I made this account, I was like, well, you know, I, I could probably find some of my old friends on here. This is cool. Like my old friends from before I was in Scientology. <laughs> So that's where, and then I told the rest of the story on that. I, I, I can tell the rest if you want, but that's that's the answer on Facebook I think you were looking for. I think you're muted. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, there was yeah. some noise going on around me, so I muted and then I forgot to unmute. Thank you. Yeah, no, the, the story is fascinating and people are really responding to it. Uh, I keep looking off at my dog and at the screen, but I'm <laughs> riveted to what you're saying. You just... You got to something you have to get used to doing streams is that the person that's hosting the stream is often not looking at you. So yeah, you just right. have to kind of go with it. Just look in the camera and tell your story is the best way to do it. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I can, I can tell the rest. So yeah. So I, I, I reached out to someone on Facebook who I'd, I'd known in high school was a really close friend of mine who I'm now engaged to, by the way. Congratulations. And, thank you. And I reached out to him and I was like, Hey, hold on a sec. Is he that handsome guy that Chris yeah. interviewed? Yeah. yeah. yeah he's, he seems really interesting. Yeah. He yeah. seems like I, a I really want interesting guy. I want guy. you guys to meet. You guys are. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to have a bromance behind your people. back. <laughs> yeah. Great. I can't, I'm looking forward to talking to him. Yeah. He seems really bright. Yeah. Yeah. He is. He's I'm sorry. I fascinating to talk to. Yeah. Um, and he's a, he's a film. He, he studied all about, film and theater and probably the same kind of stuff you did so you could probably <laughs> have quite an interesting conversation um but so i reached out to him and he answered me and then we just started talking and 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 my my intention when i started was not like oh i'm i'm trying to leave i'm not happy i was just like you know i want to find some of my friends like i was bored i was bored and lonely and i had like two roommates i could hang out with because nobody could could associate with each other during COVID at all. And, and so I'd, we just started talking and he asked me various things about what I was doing. And, 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 and we, we were texting and talking a lot for like a week and then something totally disrelated happened and everyone's phones got confiscated and confiscated for like inspection by HCO, right? They love to do this inspections of your devices. And because I I was living with 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 a person who had created the flap that was going to result in this inspection, I knew that the inspection was coming. <laughs> and so I was like I quickly erased all of our all of our correspondence. I'm like I don't want anybody being like why is she talking so much to this guy and all this whatever right i'm just like i don't want it i always kept my cars very close i didn't tell anyone anything of what i thought any of my doubts or questions or whatever for many many years i never confided in, it, in anyone so this was a similar thing i was like delete all our correspondence nope no one's seen that and i was like okay delete it all turn on my phone and then the next day when they came around to like tell everybody if they're getting their phones back or not 
was, and and I was told, oh, you're not you're not getting your phone back. You don't need a phone. You're just talking to all your friends in L.A. because I and I was talking to people in L.A. I have a lot of friends in L.A. in the Sea Org and I had just gotten. I just gotten major surgery uh, a few weeks before that, before our phones were taken. And so I was talking to a lot of people being like, hey, how's it going? And I was talking to the medical officer and I was talking to friends of mine and and you know how you how you feel when you if I don't know if you've ever gotten any major medical thing but you kind of feel like after it's done you kind of feel like huh I survived okay I want to I want to talk to people that I know and and like tell them <laughs> that I'm okay and what happened and everything so I was talking to a lot of people so then when they went to oh I can't hear you again you're muted <laughs> there we go yeah and but all of your communication on your cell phone is it was it all being routed through like a server? No, like, no, no, oh, no, no, no. We you had it open, Columbus. like you had like an yeah. unlocked phone. We were in Jeez, Columbus. You were like dangerous. <laughs> yeah, everybody who had a phone was dangerous because yeah. we were out in Columbus. There was no, there was, there were not org phones. They were all personally owned phones, or they were owned by the org, but they were still they weren't connected to anybody. Nobody could see your. You could just delete text messages or whatever, and nobody would ever see them. And they had internet access. So there you go. <laughs> so, so then, yeah, so they took my phone. Oh, you can't have it back. You don't need to talk to all these people from, from LA. And I don't know why you're doing this. Cause it was another thing on like, oh, you're, you're here on project in Columbus. You're not supposed to be talking to people in LA. It's offline. Right. Right. Offline, off purpose, off. Yeah. Off at least got to be at least four or five yeah. offs there. Yeah. And I was so mad because I had bought this phone. I paid for the plan. You know, I paid like a couple hundred bucks for it. And I, I was so mad. Plus, I needed it to do my job. Like if I was going to do any ads, which I was doing, I was doing emails and ads and all this stuff. I needed Internet access. So I'm like, OK, you just took away my Internet access. I, what am I supposed to do all day? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, you, I, you could conquer the world with a yeah, cell phone. Exactly. A smartphone and internet. I mean, you could take the world over. Yeah, with I, you. And, 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 and you can leave the Sea Org with an iPod <laughs> because an iPod acts exactly like a, can be exactly like a phone. And that's, that's what I did. Right. I had an iPod. And so when they said, turn in your phones, I was like, okay, I'll turn in my phone. I didn't turn in my iPod. I was like, nobody said turn in your devices. Right. Turn in your phones. Exactly. So I kept that. And that was how I communicated. And there was, it, it, it went like, sometimes there would be a, sometimes when my roommates would have a hot spot, she had that for a while. So I had internet access again. So I was able to talk to John again. And I was so mad from that. And, and then for whatever reason, I decided that I was going to tell him what happened. And this was a big no, no, this was taboo. You don't, you don't share inside organizational information with your non-Scientologist, non Org, you know, WOG friend. I would have gotten in so much trouble if anyone knew about that when it happened. I mean, yeah, you but even, even if I could just interject, even outside whatever your small circle is like at the Columbus org. Yeah. It, even if it was to other Scientologists or public yeah. Scientologists. Yeah. Or your you, family. You, if yeah, you have Scientology you would, family, you're never, you're not going to tell them, Oh, my phone yeah. was taken away. No, no way. Okay. I'm sorry. Go on, please. <laughs> so I was so mad about that, that I decided to tell them, I'm like, they took my phone. I'm sorry. You haven't heard from me in a few days or whatever. They took my phone. This is my new, you know, address. This is how you reach me. My new email address, whatever. I made like a new email and everything. And I deleted my Facebook account because I was, I was petrified that they were going to somehow figure out. <coughs> Sorry. One second. I was petrified that they were going to somehow find out that I had made this Facebook account. And so I deleted that. I told him to delete it, to delete, you know, unfriend me, whatever, make sure there was no connection just in case anyone had seen it. And then I started corresponding with him with my using my iPod. And then when the org opened back up, I um, eventually when we were going out again, because the whole COVID thing for, for a while, we, everybody was just inside the org. I wasn't going out hardly at all. 
And then we started going out book selling again. I started doing promo and I was often um, around the uh, OSU campus, which is Wi-Fi access for like blocks and blocks and blocks. And it's huge campus. And I was around there doing promo. It and was open. You, you could get on it like you were yeah. a student. Yeah. Wow. You could just walk in. You could walk into any of the buildings. All the buildings were open, you know, 8 a.m. to whatever time of night. You can just walk in any building, walk around practically every single building in OSU. Right. Okay. I mean, I see your, I, I, your I, member escape zone. Yeah. And a peak, I could just imagine somebody could just walk in there and start like moving furniture out and just steal a bunch of their furniture if they wanted to, because it was such a huge campus and you could just walk in and there was yeah. like, yeah. nobody ever asked me what I was doing. No security was ever like, are you a student? But what are you doing? You were just accustomed to working on a Scientology property where <laughs> things were so, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm sure the university had cameras and cops yeah. and that, the, you know, they kept yeah. their furniture locked down, but it's yeah. just, we're not used to having like open spaces where yeah. people are not like making a play for our credit cards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I would go around and I would put up posters inside their buildings on their bulletin boards. And of course they take them down all the time. So I would just go back and do another round so I could spend several days. Really? They, well, hold on. You would put promo on their bulletin boards <laughs> and there's other promo, right? Like you weren't the only promo. Yeah. It wasn't right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. The other, but, but the Scientology stuff, they, nah, 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 yeah, we they don't would, want this they stuff would, here. Nah. This is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I went, I went in their, their psychi their, uh, uh, psychiatry building, psychology building and put stuff everywhere. <laughs> I felt so good. Of after yeah, that. of course you did. Yeah. <laughs> like you really struck a blow at the yeah. enemy, huh? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, but I did that. I like, showed them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 it was perfect because there was all these places where there was just like you know lounge areas and chairs and like all this these places you could just sit for hours and no one's even gonna come by you for hours. Nobody knows where you are. If anyone from the org comes to pick you up, they're gonna text you and say, "Oh, I'm gonna pick you up." And you just come out. <laughs> it's right. not like they're gonna find where you are. Wow. Yeah. So I would just sit around in these buildings after after a while. After I was like, I'm not doing promo anymore. I'm gonna figure out what to do with my life. I would just go and like and sit in a building and i would i would text with john or i would watch videos or i would talk to him or i would like like try to figure out what the heck i'm gonna do and that went on for about a year yeah uh, it was actually exactly a year from the time that my phone got taken um down to the day actually june 11th my phone got got confiscated june 11th 2020 june 11th 2021 i left the sea org <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah. I mean, people, you know, they, they look at us and they think, how could you, you know, I mean, any organization that says, give me your phone. I, mean, I know. That's what he said. He was like, <clears throat> what do you mean they took? Is it is it their phone? I'm like, nope, it's mine. It's my property. So they just took your property. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's it's complicated. Like, I, I, I just tried to justify it or sure it of course it, yeah you don't understand uh here's what's happening uh the world yeah. is spinning out of control uh this is our last chance humanity's last chance so it's like if i got to give up my property it's not a big deal yeah. yeah exactly something something like that yeah and 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 he just very gently i don't know if you've seen his is his interview he explained how he yeah i it. watched it i didn't see the whole thing but i watched enough of it to know that yeah. we're going to be friends <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh that's cool i like that yeah, because he he just very gently um, got me to see that it was it was an abusive relationship, and I needed to get out. I didn't need yeah, to leave. Yeah, 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 for absolutely for sure. Yeah, and then he he got me. He convinced me to speak to somebody from the Aftermath Foundation because at first I was like, oh no, they're just a bunch of of disaffected, suppressive people who are just they're just evil people basically. They're crazy. Yeah, they're nuts. And, uh, and then as soon as I, uh, there was a bunch of, of back and forth on that. And he said, it was very funny because he, he sent the original email to Aaron without giving my name or any information about me. And, and Aaron is like, so let me get this straight. You're not a Scientologist. You've never been in Scientology, never been in the Sea Org. And a Sea Org member who's in the Sea Org is talking to you about leaving the Sea Org and leaving Scientology. Wait, what? <laughs> I know, he thought it was so a crazy. joke. <laughs> he, he thought it was a total joke. 
Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, you came so close to, to not escaping. Yeah. I, yeah. I, really did. I, I came as close as someone, as, as, as somebody from the org, another staff member walking by the car that I was the passenger in driving away to go to the airport. And if she would have just turned her head and looked at who was in the car. <laughs> yeah, one. exactly. Yeah. It's a, just, it's amazing. It's just, it's like, uh, it's like when Val jumped in the, uh, yeah. you know, when I was up at gold when that happened, when, when she jumped in the trunk of that car, I mean, it's just, you know, yeah, I, and, and I didn't want to go through the whole, you know, sec check, sending back to LA conditions, they're going to oh, work. Yeah. It would have been a, it would have been a nightmare yeah. and you might've broken down. And just I know, I know because there's a lot, mm -hmm. I know so many people in LA. I, I, I know the external security chief personally. I know the security Kristen, chief personally. Kristen, yeah, Kristen, what's her name? Kristen, Kristen uh, Pedersen. Yeah. yeah. I know all these name, people Kristen. personally. They change and, last name. Like yeah, I change underwear. Right. And, and, anyway. and they're friends of mine. Like I know the commanding officer of the right. CMO, you know, and they're all friends of mine. I like to, yeah, they're going to get to you. Career. They're going to get to you. You, you. Yeah. And I didn't want that. I'm like, if I'm going to decide to do this, I'm going to decide one way or another. I'm not going to be convinced. I'm not going to talk about it with anybody. Right. Either I'm going to once again, decide everything's fine and I'm going to stay, which I've been doing over the years, many, many times, or I'm just going to go. And that's, I'm not going to talk to anybody about it. So and, and once I spoke to Mark, it was so easy because he was just like, well, just let us know what you need. If you need yeah. a phone, if you need a plane ticket, you need someone to pick you up, whatever you need, whenever you're ready, you can go. Yeah. And yeah. it's so opposite to the steward who like, like in the steward, they just control everything. It's like, okay, you're going to go on, you know, you're going to go and be posted at this place. At this time, you're going to get on the plane. You're going to do this, do this, 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 this. Everything's like so controlled. And this was like, the total opposite like what do you right. want to do i was like wow that's good i like that <laughs> this is cool <laughs> anyway yeah no it's an amazing story I, it's it, and you know it's like you hear people who've gone to war like soldiers and and the you ask you know, they tell that what they're fighting for is the guy next to them yeah. and you have a lot of that sort of spirit of camaraderie with some of these people that you're talking about who are your friends like, and it could make it difficult to leave because you went through these things and you supported right. one another. Right. And, you know, it's, yeah, it could be there, really, there was you know, so, I know so many people who would have tried to talk me out of leaving and, and, right. a lot, and there would have been many people who'd probably succeed in doing that, including yeah. my immediate senior in Columbus. She was like, she was like my favorite senior I'd ever had. She was a really she was a really cool person and I felt bad yeah. like when I left and I, I texted, I texted, I even texted someone while I was on the plane. I texted someone in the org to tell them where I was. Cause I'm like, I don't want somebody to think I've been like kidnapped and murdered and, and, and I don't want to scare my, my friends, you know, these people who were my friends, I want them to at least know that I'm alive and okay. So I texted someone and I'm like, I'm very sorry. I'm leaving. Um, I'm, uh, and I, I just said, I'm going with family. And I said, you know, please tell Angela, I'm really sorry. And she's a great person and I love her and I'm sorry, but I have to go. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you, what you mean. It's not easy. I mean, there, it, it broke my heart. There were people that I had that I can no longer be friends with, yeah. you know, yeah, the, I and, I, I, and I, I, I even wrote a, a letter to someone who I got into Scientology years ago just to square things. And then I never send it. Cause I'm like, no, they're going to think it's coming from a crazy person. Yeah. So, you know, why even send it? So. Yeah. Oh, there's some people in the chat that are asking about John's interview. I can give you, uh, maybe you can put it in the link. You can put, uh, you can put it in this description. Yeah. I'll, I'll put it in the, sh in the show notes in the description. Yeah. I'll put a link to right. it. The one on, um, on, on Aaron's channel. channel. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. there's actually not another interview like that. Because he's the person on the other side of the story That's that right. helped yeah. Catherine to get out in a very yeah. rational way. And today they're engaged. So it's just, yeah. it's a, that's a great story. And we're moving back to Oregon, which is great. Wow, nice. We'll be in the we're same leaving, time zone. Yeah. yeah, we're leaving in a couple of weeks. Oh, nice. Nice. That's, a, that's, a, that's another reason why it's blurred in the background. My apartment's a mess because we're getting ready to move. Yeah, no, I hear you. That's the reason yeah. why I have a backdrop because you don't want to see my house. Yeah. And just one thing I wanted I, I wanted to mention before I forget again, Please. which is um, 
um, there, there, there's when you're in the Sea Org, and I guess maybe not even just as well, even probably when you're just a Scientologist, there's such a, a, a de emphasis on friends and family, and especially on family. Um, which I experienced, you know, having to disconnect from my mom and my sister and having to decide, okay, you know, I've had all these lifetimes where I've had family and I've never had Scientology. And so I'm going to pick Scientology, kind of that type of thing, right? Such a de-emphasis on, on family connections. Mm -hmm. So about a month ago, I experienced something which was the opposite because, I mean, un unfortunately, John had a, had a, a death in his family. His father passed away. Mm -hmm. And so we went to Oregon to spend time with the family. And we actually saw him before before he passed away, which was good. We got there in time. Mm -hmm. And it was so... God, I'm going to get emotional talking about this. But it was so... It was, it was... In many ways, it was very uplifting for me personally. Because... <sighs> If I would have been in the Sea Org, like say I was in the Sea Org and I was married to a Sea Org member and, you know, his father died and we went to the funeral, it would just be like, go to the funeral for one or two days and leave. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we went there for about two weeks. Wow. And we were, uh, he was with him when he passed and we spent a lot of time with his sisters and nephews and his mom really supported his mom. She's a great, great lady. And we just spent time just being together and, you know, getting through this and being there for her and, you know, taking walks and just talking about things. And, and we put together a whole slideshow for, for the, the, for the funeral and he put together this amazing video, which, which maybe, maybe he'll, he'd be willing to let you see, but it's because his father was a musician. Mm. So we took one of his songs or he took one of his songs and he, so he was, he was singing the song and then showed all these pictures of his pictures of his father over the year, over the years. And at the beginning of the video, it was his, his grandsons, John's nephews, singing the same song in the apartment wow. where and 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 the uh <laughs> the room the bedroom was right next to the living room so you wouldn't know this and nobody would know this unless we told them but in in the bedroom next to where they were singing the song was his father mm. and so it was it was it was really wow. really touching and it just no, felt so good yeah. to spend all this time with these people and like just really and not have like any sort of, yeah. oh, I have to go tomorrow or, you know, I can only be here for two days. We were there for two weeks. And yeah, you, yeah, you would have been just nonstop looking yeah. at your watch or yeah. just having to run so the whole thing. It's different from, from, from yeah. a Seorg or a Scientology experience of like, I got to get back to clearing the planet. It's like, no, this is your family. Like, that's what's important. That's what's right, right. really brought right. that home to me. And it was very, it was a very, I've never experienced anything like that before. It was very emotional and, but it was good. It was, it was, it was good. It was wow. Good. That's, so, that's a, such a touching story. Yeah. It's one of the benefits of having your freedom back. Yeah. Yeah. Is that you get that time with your family. I spent a day with my mom because my mom, and my sister are there too. So I got to spend a day with my mom and, it was uh, it was just amazing. Like it feels nice. so good just yeah. to, just to be with family. It feels really really good. Yeah, totally. Okay, good. Well, I think uh, we've we've hit almost two hours, so I think we're going to wrap it up. If, okay. if anybody ha if anybody has uh, a question, now's the time to get it in. Uh, I know my dog's about to just <laughs> bust again. Uh, he's no, he's been very patient. As some of us, we have to do our our streaming work around our 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 animals. Uh, but he's been a good boy. He's not, oh, he's asleep on the floor there. Look at what that. kind of dog oh, is it? Gosh. He's a little uh, lemon beagle. He's a cute, you know, he's a, like a brown and white beagle. He's yeah. slightly small. He's about two years old. You should he's bring cool. him on I, sometime. I have. I've, I've sort of lifted yeah. him up 
that's great. I've, I've lifted him up a couple of times and yeah, brought I, him I, in. I can't wait to have pets again. I've been holding off until I get settled, but I'm really yeah, you, yeah, you want to do that? That's kind of tough. I'm I wouldn't. A person. I wouldn't. I don't want him to hear this, but I wouldn't recommend getting a beagle because yeah. they're they're psychotic. <laughs> okay, so. okay no, good. They're, <laughs> they're they're great dogs and they're super smart, but they're really stubborn. Oh, that's and, funny. And they're completely food uh, food uh, you know uh, whatever motivated. you know. Yeah, food made of it. You know they have the beagles now at all the at all the Narcanons. Yeah, uh, they have drug sniffing. Yeah, beagles. that's right. That's right. They're part of the staff. They're on the yeah board. yeah they are I on the board. Yeah, they even have yeah. a uniform. <laughs> uh, yeah, they probably they have a, an official leash. I remember when all this was announced. But. Yeah, you know, I did that whole. I was the one who. Oh, you I, did. I yeah, remember there was twenty eight films. I think. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, me and another me and another guy wrote the films. We uh, had, did consulted on everything. We worked at Abel uh, every day. We were working at ASI, but you know, Abel's next door to ASI. That's the Association for Better Living and Education. One of the wonderful acronyms in the Scientology Christmas tree of wonderfulness that it brings to the world, <laughs> uh, according to its own records. Uh, yeah, I worked in the program. I left Gold in 2014. I saw Miss Gavage real quick. He blew out of there in 2013. Then sometime 2014, I got a message. Come to L.A. And so then I went down there because they needed to redo Narcanon because there had been a number of deaths and there had been some lawsuits. And, uh, you know, drug rehab is like... I think when I was doing some research, I, 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 in 2015, 13,000 people died in America in drug rehab-related deaths. So it wasn't like Narcanon was the only drug rehab that people were dying in. But, but the most, probably the worst one was, I can't think of her name, Stacy, somebody her parents were suing. But uh, she had, was given a weekend furlough from the program to go visit her parents. She came back in with uh some uh like heroin in a cavity in a body cavity right and they had her in the withdrawal there's a place where you go through withdrawals and it's supposed to be supervised but they left her in there alone and this thing of this package of drugs opened up inside her body and she died of an overdose oh, and it was really tragic uh, of course, Miss Gavage blamed her parents. So, like, her parents are trying to get a payday. They're the ones that should have been looking after her. I mean, it's just like the, wow. the victim gets blamed at every step along the way. But no, I worked on that whole program. I, that was like, uh, I that was me paying my debt for Scientology having helped me get off drugs, which they, they actually did inadvertently. But, um, and then I did that whole ad campaign, uh, uh, Drug Free for Good. That thing, the, which is yeah, still their yeah. slogan. Yeah, I did that whole thing. And then me and this other guy, this pro writer, um, they needed to present this new program to all the Narcanon EDs from around the world. It's probably 30, 40 people, right? Yeah. And Ms. Gavage was really worried that, like, since the whole program was being changed, and, and these guys, some of these guys make a lot of money out there in Narcanon programs, he was worried that some of them were going to, were going to balk. They were going to, accept it so he thought let's just fight them all into la and we'll have like a conference and present it to them which you know if they're in la and they freak out you can just pull them right into a session and say what the hell is your problem pal we're giving you gold here yeah. so but but then he was like but i can't give it you know you would expect to be rtc right you expect the man to do that presentation to the eds but he, he said no you know i can't do it because it's a lot it's it's not sea work like norkin it's not a sea work thing he said so i can't do it he's he was really like hyper aware of being pulled into lawsuits so like like if somebody else died at norkin and he had proposed the program then somebody yeah. could see him right so he's like why don't you guys do it All right so then me and another guy we for two days we we presented the whole Narcanon program. Oh, wow. Uh, this is right before the SOP opened. Then we went over to SOP. And so it was me and, uh, what's his name? Uh, me and, and Chris, this guy I worked with, a writer. And uh, I can't think of his name, but there's a guy, he's a CMO guy, who's one of the program's ops kind of dudes. Chris over the... Guider? No, not Chris Guider. Uh, the, 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 what is his name? He's married to, what's her name? The woman <laughs> who, who you know, yeah. You know, what's his name? Married to, <laughs> married to what's her name? Why can't I think of her name? I know all these people so well. She's the one who put together Bridge and the Decem Center. Molly. Oh, 
Oh, Her, 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 Hurtling. Jason. Her, Jason. Hurtling. Jason Hurtling. Yeah. 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 He, he did the uniform part of it. He presented the uniforms and the legal stuff. We did all the fun stuff and including the beagle you know the, and there was an attorney there who was you know the, all the guy does is health stuff like health health industry stuff so he yeah. presented the, the, the uh, then we had him there and then the trainer came and introduced the beagle the, the beagle was released that's not why i have a beagle uh, uh, miss gabbage i think they were shelley's beagles they had like five of them and when i got a beagle somebody said who didn't know i'd left they'd say oh i know why you got a beagle you got a beagle you know because ron had beagles and cob had beagles COB are the meanest beagles in the world. Those dogs attacked me <laughs> twice. Okay. I, I mean, I lost a $200 pair of jeans because of those, those well, dogs. Well, they're just emulating their, their, their totally. owner. It's, yeah. It's an axiom. One yeah. of Mitch's axioms is, you know, mean dog owners beget mean dogs. Yeah. Like that's just it. Yeah. And that, that's my piece of philosophy cake totally. for you all today. Totally. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, we, we did that, that thing. So now I'm trying to make up for it. <laughs> so, yeah, I remember. I remember when the whole Narcanon thing came out, I'm, and of course, it's pitched. It's pitched internally in the Sea Org of, of making an ideal Narcanon program, and this is the coolest thing. And and nobody says, you know, you're never briefed on the fact that a couple people died and there's lawsuits. Yeah, there was actually four lawsuits going on from four yeah, deaths. Yeah, uh, you'll, you'll never hear about that in the Sea Org. You'll no, just hear about no. You know, Cob yeah. is making an ideal org. Or an ideal Narcanon program, and we yeah. find this. And well, it was. It's mostly ideal in that it's ideally uh, proofed against being sued, because that was the yeah. main thing. Like, yeah. you know, like we made one of the first. Uh, we did an introductory film. What's his name? Uh, the the oh god, the ex con who started the whole thing. Uh, the, the, all these names are escaping my brain. Uh, uh, the guy who started Bobby, it in prison. Bobby. No, 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 he, no, no, no. He's a. Uh, I can't think of his name. One of you guys knows. Um, I just anyway. He's the guy that started Narcanon. He started in prison. He read Fundamentals of Thought. He wrote to Hubbard. He said, "Hey, I want to start a drug rehab pro program based off of off of your book called Narcanon uh, because by reading that book, he saw the he he saw the supposedly he he became aware of man's potential to heal himself so he he got like you know it was like talk therapy he'd get prisoners yeah. together and they talk about stuff and he called it narcanon and uh willie benitez was his name yeah. and he was always 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 mentioned as the founder of narcanon one of the first things we did was expunge his name out of there because miss gavage said who is this willie benitez guy like <laughs> he's no he's nobody you know he's never done nothing for narcanon i mean yeah sure he came up with the name but it's all based on hubbard so, um, yeah, we got him out of there. And, 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 and there was a film very specifically aimed at telling the, the intake people coming in on Arcanon and their parents, whoever yeah. was paying for it, telling them this is based on L. Ron Hubbard and blah, 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 blah. Because, you know, it's, those are the ways you avoid lawsuits that nobody can say later. They tricked us that it was Scientology. You know, the, they, they really just checked all the We checked all the boxes. And then we made a bunch of films that just told people how to do you know, objectives and all this other stuff, but yeah. Wow. It's so, so interesting hearing about, uh, hearing about the other end of these programs. Like there's, uh, there's been so much of that over the years. I'm sure I can think of, I can think of. Oh, yeah. I mean, endlessly. I mean, I worked on so yeah. much stuff. It's crazy. Cause it's like, we could just do two hours on the, um, on the industry of death museum. Because, uh, oh, that would be fascinating. Yeah. Wrote an entire chapter in my book, and that's probably one of the longest chapters in the whole book because it goes into Scientology's history with being uh, being um, anti Scientology. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, anti psych. You know, where the history of it and how it probably initially. I mean, I, I was kind of back and forth on the origin of it. You've heard about the two famous letters that Hubbard offered Dianetics to the APA, the yeah. American Psychiatric yeah. American. That never happened. I made that film, the story of. Of, of uh, book one that never happened hubbard made that up the, because you think about it everything that man ever wrote regarding dynamic scientology is in some is in possession of the church yeah if he if when he supposedly claims to offer it to them let me ask you this what form did he offer it to them in the dianetics book didn't exist yet he was motivated to write it because they rejected dianetics so what did he send them we don't know. 
So no, it's a it's a marketing ploy. It's like you uh, see it on TikTok. Yeah. They don't want you to know about this. This is the mental health that you can do at home that they reject it. They don't want you to know about. They don't this want. Is, yeah. It's the yeah, it's, it's, the, it's a, the mystical they. That's yeah. It's a totally well. He had the APA and the AMA as the mystical day, but it's the reject by the status quo that proves that I'm legitimate. And he made that up because he's, he was a little bit of a marketing genius, and I fell for it. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, because that's the story, and that his friends, a guy named Dr. Winner and a guy named what's his name, the sci-fi editor Joseph, uh, well, not, not uh, 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 John Campbell, they say, well, Ron, why don't you write a book? And so then he writes a dynamics book. But I was talking to Chris Shelton about this. We were going over it uh, offline, and. Um, he reminded me that some months after the Dianetics book came out, the reviews that the book got, I mean, you can't find them online, but people know about the reviews. The reviews from the scientific and mental health community and engineers, doctors, I mean, everybody was just like, this is the stupidest shit ever written. And that's when he wrote, he made the story up about the two letters of rejection. He made them up after the fact because he had his book was so so broadly rejected by the scientific community that then he said, well, I, I offered it to the APA and AMA, and they said no. And then he used that as part of his marketing. So, and that's, wow. that's all it was. I love, uh, so, hearing, yeah. I love hearing this stuff. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I mean, it, and it, I didn't even, I didn't even realize, just yeah, I didn't realize that until I got out and I really looked at it and I started looking at all of the bullshit that I'd sort of, you know, bought and, the other one is, I, we're not going to get into this now because it's a really long story, but it's the story of the uh, Siberia USA. Have you ever heard about that? It's pretty yeah. well known. Yes, yeah. Siberia USA. This was a program uh, back in the early 50s uh, that was supposedly funded by the Rockefellers, which it wasn't, to build a mental health uh, a labor camp in, in Alaska where you could and then change the commitment laws and then send people up there. It was a total lie. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and it's been a trope of Scientology and an underpinning uh, like part of the, the CCHR narrative. It's a complete lie. It was, uh, it, I've talked about it, I've written about it. It was actually the opposite. And, and L. Ron Hubbard took credit for it. And all they really did was they killed off a bill that was intended to protect native Alaskans who were being railroaded into mental health hospitals and then a, a private citizen who was a friend of Teddy Roosevelt's was being paid huge sums of money to keep them incarcerated. They were, they were in those days before Alaska was a state, it was illegal to be insane. They had a, they had a board of seven people who were unqualified, would find these people insane, railroad them to a hospital in Oregon where the government would pay a ton of money for each of the people to a private guy who was a banker, investor, politician, friend of the president's. And then the Alaska bill was supposed to defeat that. It was supposed to fund proper mental health in Alaska. And a bunch of wacko right wing, the you know, religious zealots yeah. made it into an anti-commie thing because it was the 50s. And they were like, no, these are that's a communist plot to take over America. And Hubbard was like David Miscavige went on the Ted Koppel show and he's still bragging about it. And it's a total lie. It's one of the, so you know. These, and I made a documentary about how wonderful CCHR is because one of the reasons that CCHR is so wonderful is because they defeated the Alaska, because of, they defeated Siberia USA. What they did was they, they enabled the state to keep incarcerating native Alaskans for money. So it's just like, you know, you horrible. should take the whole, you should take the whole uh, uh, story that, that Scientology has on their website about like L. Ron Hubbard's life or whatever, where they like, tell like an abbreviated version and just like <laughs> break it down where it's like yeah you know, well this time and he did one it's like you know, yeah so i mean the, the things i know or what i know i mean but I, if you read the bald faced messiah i mean that yeah, that, that, that book does that true. so well but there i mean there's do, do things i want to do but i can't even get my book out because it's too much fun interacting with this community <laughs> Uh, you great. know, like Mike Rinder. I was love like, your interviews. I think I've listened. I, I've listened to most of your. Thanks. Thank them. you very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, like when I got out, Mike was one of the first people I called, and he was he was saying, "Wow, you, you could do what you did for them. You could do that against them, yeah. and um, that that would have a, a, you know, so that's kind of 
kind of what I'm trying to do. I do want to, the, the industry of death museum is online and I do need to figure out a way, like you can walk through it online. It's, yeah. it's a flash programming or something. I might need some IT help on it, but I want to go through that and download the whole tour and then actually take people on the tour. Oh, this and, is great. Oh my yeah, God. Because, because about, there's about 10% of it that's true and people should know about that stuff. I mean, there really is some, some nasty yeah, there's stuff some there. horrific things in there but yeah it doesn't mean that the entire subject is no it doesn't true. it doesn't i it's mean like, uh, I, right after shortly after i came out of the sewer guy I, I had the opportunity actually to talk to a psychologist and and i did a couple i did a couple weeks you know talking to her every every you know a couple times a week for about a month or so because mm -hmm. i was having a little bit of a hard time just interacting with the world <laughs> So yeah, we, you were isolated. Like yeah, my therapist, yeah. me, I didn't even think of it. She's like, oh, you yeah. were so isolated for 30 it's years. True. Yeah. It's just the isolation just, but, but it was me. great. And it was, it was nothing like, like Scientology says psychology is it's like, Oh, you know, they just tell you what's wrong with you or they just evaluate. It was, it wasn't like that at all. She was fantastic. So I'm like, okay, yeah. I'll so yeah, I know. I know. I mean, one of the, somebody asked me the other day in a chat, I think it was, Juliana Bittencourt, I'm not sure, um, asked me about the most shocking thing that I found out, you know, when I left. And uh, and 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 one the first thing I said was um, that that therapy is really good. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, wait a minute, they lied about all this. I mean, I was I had problems with psychiatry before I went in, and I had problems definitely after I got out, and I had big problems when I was in. But they're not a monolith. You can't paint them all the same way. There's some great, very helpful psychiatrists. And there's some therapists that aren't great. But I sort of see them as psychiatrists are like witch doctors and therapists are like healers. So one of them is like, you know, doing rituals and potions and crazy stuff. And the other ones are sort of holding your hand and helping you feel better. So, you know, that's, I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but that's yeah. kind of how I see it. But yeah, I, I, I am. I do want to do some more things, breaking down some of this stuff. Because yeah, but yeah, especially I'd, I'd love to have another talk with you. It's fascinating. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, the two things that I I really want to talk about. The one is the museum, but uh, like specifically, when I when I I, ha I broke some of it down in my book. I talked about some of the things like there's a very famous story. I forget his name. I'll, I'll think of it. But there was a real Phineas Gage was a railroad railroad worker in the 18, late 1800s. And he, he was, uh, you know, they were blowing up some huge granite boulders and they drilled a hole in. What they do is they, they drill a hole in the boulder and then they put a piece of stick of dynamite in it. And then mm -hmm. they take a big metal rod and they'd feed the dynamite into the hole. And the, the dynamite blew up and it blew the rod through his face and out the top of his head. And it changed his personality. And then there's this whole mythical story about how this led to the lobotomy because this is where they realized that taking a piece of a person's brain out uh, could change their personality. And so CCHR, the museum, as I helped them put this story forward about Phineas Cage, it's a complete and utter lie. Wow. It never happened. For one thing, he healed up. They said that he was a really nice guy and then became a mean guy or he was a mean guy, became a nice guy. I don't remember, but he healed up. The miracle was that he actually healed up and he returned to being a pretty normal person. What it did do was it, it told surgeons that maybe they shouldn't be so afraid to do brain surgery. And that's when they started to removing tumors from people's brain. So it wasn't a bad thing at all. Wow. But, and there's this whole fake story about how that was the uh, the the uh, the inspiration for the lobotomy, which is a complete and utter falsehood. But then there's Did another. Did you work on any of the CCHR documentaries? Well, I supervise all of them. Wow. Um, because, well, I did the first one, which was the museum, the industry of Those death, are DVD. horrifying. Yeah, horrifying. I know. I, I've, I felt kind of guilty. I mean, I, I used to joke. I mean, I have a little bit of a morbid sense of humor, so I sort of chalked the whole thing up to that. But you know when you go in there, did you ever go through there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know when you first go in, you go into a padded cell? Mm -hmm. right? Okay, so that was my idea. I thought, we're going to really scare the shit out of people. We're going to put them in a padded cell. We're going to lock the door. We're going to show them the really scary film that looks like a, 
looks like a trailer from like a 50s like invasion of the body snatchers yeah, right yeah something that's really you know pull out all the stops and make a really scary film and uh, i used to joke that on the outside the door because they wanted it to be scary they wanted to like scare people yeah. uh, against to be against psychiatry and i used to joke that they should put like a little slot like where you pull a, uh, like a piece of brochure out of they should put a little slot outside the door with like air sickness bags <laughs> You know, with the with, with the uh, thing that said uh, psychiatry <laughs> and injury of death, and then that would be like a little souvenir. Yeah. But there were people that fainted and like threw up, and like it was you know because you know they used to send nursing schools through there. There were classes from private nursing schools that they it was on their curriculum to go through there and learn about psychiatry. So uh, it was like, yeah, it was really crazy, but it was. Uh, I know one 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 guy who was uh, there. Were, there was also a, a school near there, the Los Angeles School of the Recording Arts, like a school where you could go to learn to be a sound recordist and a mixer. Yeah. And they used to send their students through there because it was very close to them. But they also needed, as an assignment, to go to an installation where there was surround sound presentations. You know, like the 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 way the sound was installed there was very impressive. Yeah. So these recording artist guys, and then one of those guys is now the senior audio mixer at, at SMP. So, <laughs> so there you go. They, they recruited one dude. Actually, he was recruited through somebody else, but he told me, yeah, I'd been through there, you know, because I, when I was studying at the uh, recording art school, that was like an assignment to go through there. So it was pretty crazy. I like to talk about that. I like to talk about superpower sometime because... I spent maybe a year and a half, two years working on, I did all of the, the audio visual drills. I designed them all and directed all of the, the orientation films, the drill films and all, and anything that uses audio video on the fourth uh -huh. floor. I did all that and then supervised the installation and people don't realize that there's no LRH on the fourth floor. <laughs> he didn't do any of that stuff. We made it up. Hello. Oh, the, the super, all oh, those superpowers. Yeah. Yeah. We made it up. We made it up. Not the auditing stuff, but all yeah. of the perceptive stuff, all Hubbard said was the follower. And, and I think you guys, you talked about this with Alex when you guys talked about superpower. Yeah. It, there's a there's a list of perceptics, right? Which is like whatever, 50 something. I don't even remember. 57, 57 right? Yeah. We're going to have to pull it out. It's just a couple of pages in the back of a book called Self-Analysis. It just lists them well, it's all It's in the out. zero to eight book too. Yeah. Okay. Good. Right, good. Right, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But I think it first appeared as self-analysis, but yeah, because yeah, that was like a Dianetics book. But he said, "Do drills for each of these perceptics." That's all he said. And then we made up the drills. Yeah. Like there's, there's no. Wow. There's yeah, that no... was being worked on for years. I actually did some of the pilot on those drills. They did. Uh, yeah. They did, they did some pilots at the HCB with some of the staff. Right on the on the physical drills, the ones in the machines. Uh, not the machines. No, I I looked at a whole bunch of images, and then I did like a drill after that. And... Oh, you, did you did you do the impression one where you'd have to look at it, remember what it was? I think so. Yeah. yeah. And they 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 make them faster and faster and faster until yeah. they put it up for like a twentieth of a fiftieth of a second. Yeah. And then you'd have to identify it. Yeah, that was. Yeah, we did all that stuff at Gold. We just literally made it up. Yeah. yeah so it was yeah it was a lot of fun I, I, I that would be fun to talk about because i spent a lot, a lot i worked on a lot of time i yeah, put in on that and it was there's reasons why it took so long because the thing was just a total a total um uh, it was just a total disaster one of many disasters okay so we've now gone over to, to <laughs> uh, kind of try to hold it to us so we're going to bring this to a controlled landing i'm going to put the flaps down drop the gear <laughs> Catherine, this has been so delightful. You yeah, know, this is all awesome. of my expectations. It just, <laughs> you know, I captioned this thing with teammates and strangers inside the bubble because you and I were teammates. That's right. That's but right. we were total strangers, and that's yeah. so common in the working for Scientology universe. So, right. anyway, thanks everybody for watching, and um, we'll be back. <laughs> yeah, we'll be back. And just you know, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your night. Bye-bye. Okay. Now I gotta just it always takes me.